call to order our regular session of June 26, 2018. First order of business is the opening prayer and pledges of allegiance to the flags of the United States and the state of Texas. If you'll join me in standing, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola will lead us this evening. Sir? Yeah, before I begin, just wanted to share that last month our city lost a re really good man, Mr. Larry Franklin. Now, Larry ser served on our TSAC for a number of years, and I met Larry when I was assigned as liaison to the committee. Make a long story short, I believe Larry was one of the most authentic, open, honest, and caring individuals I had ever met. And I was honored that he considered me his friend. I ask that we have a moment of silence for Larry. May God bless till we meet again, my friend. It is written that in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It was the ultimate word of truth, enlightenment, and righteousness. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask for your guidance as we conduct the business of our city. We ask that you open our minds and light a path for us to follow. Built on a foundation of truth and righteousness, as we endeavor to serve the needs of our community, inspired by your teachings and the Holy Word. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Dr. Scagliola. First item that we have this evening, we have a presentation. It's a proclamation designating July as Park and Recreation Month. And I'm going to come down and read that proclamation. And the proclamation reads, whereas parks and recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of Schertz, and whereas our parks and recreation facilities are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our community, ensuring the health of all citizens and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of our community and the region. And whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, and the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community, and whereas parks and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and, recreate, and recreate outdoors. And whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas the city of Shirts, Texas recognizing, recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources, now therefore I, Michael Carpenter, Mayor of the city of Shirts, do hereby call upon all citizens of Shirts to join together and recognize July 2018 as Park and Recreation Month in the city of Shirts, Texas. Um, that said, first of all, well, I'll give it to you afterward. Microphone's yours. Thank you. Um, I'm Lauren Shrum. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Shirts. Um, you see all these green shirts out in the audience. Um, these are all the members who help make Parks and Recreation possible for the City of Shirts. So I want to ask all of those folks to come up right now and I'm going to talk a little bit about the groups. We're going to take a photo. So we have members of our Shirts Area Senior Center. We have members of our Friends of Crescent Bend Nature Park. We have members of the YMCA. 
We have members um, from SISA, members from BVYA, Eagle Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, San Antonio Astronomical Association. All these people help make our parks and rec recreation programs happen in our city. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, our events team here at the city and our parks staff, our parks crew, come on up. Our little team of eight could not get half of the things we get done if it wasn't um, for all these volunteers in the community. So, <laughs> thank you for turning out. Thank you for your support. Um, and yes. Squeeze in a little bit closer. We're friendly in Parks and Rec. Sideways? Sideways. You can't go sideways. <laughs> you take up less space fun ways. Thank you all for what you do for the community. All right, next up we have a presentation regarding the recent City of Shirts, Texas Association of Municipal Information Officers, or TAMIO Awards. <laughs> Looks like we had a good showing. <laughs> yes, we did. Absolutely. Okay, good evening, Council Mayor. Um, this pa oh, well, I was going to say this past week, but this was a couple of weeks ago. We attended our annual TAMIO conference, and uh, the annual conference is where they host their award ceremony. Um, we entered several entries and we did come home with four awards. Uh, the first one we'll go over is the Award of Honor, which we won for Electronic Report, which was our, city, our State of the City video. Um, so this was a judge's comment. Uh, the entry was well produced. It does a good job of presenting the findings of the 2016 survey and describing the active approach the city has taken in response to it. Uh, the video highlights a number of programs and initiatives designed to help the city deliver real important uh, improvements uh, to Shirts residents. So these were judged a little differently this year than in the past. Um, in the past, TAMIO has used their members to uh, create judging pools of professionals that are in the communications world that they know that are not TAMIO members. Um, this year we partnered with two other state agencies in Minnesota and in North Carolina, and so those professionals are the ones that evaluated uh, the awards. We also took home award of honor for the best use of promotional item. So we decided to revamp our shirts shirt bumper sticker that's definitely been a staple in the community since the 80s. Um, and we are going to be doing more with that, so stay tuned. We also took home the award of excellence for best recurring special event, event population under 100,000. So um, there are population breaks in some categories and this is one of them. Uh, so any population, any city with a population under 100,000, that's who we were competing against for best reoccurring event. So kudos to the number of departments, parks, fire, PD, EMS, public affairs. Um, there's the YMCA as well that we partner with for this event. You, you want to maybe ask anybody who's helped with that event yeah, who's exactly. in the room to stand up, please? Yeah. Fire department. Fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this event has um, grown significantly in the last couple of years and it's definitely a testament to these folks' hard work. Um, so this event award is shared by all. And then finally, we won the Award of Excellence under the brochures, flyers, and posters category for our Mission Vision Values posters that we have proudly displayed at all 19 buildings. Mm -hmm. So um, this was uh, something that staff wanted to um, 
make sure that was visible to the public, to the employees as they enter the buildings. They know what we're about um, here at the City of Shirts, and uh, the judge's comments reflect that as well. So that was us at our awards ceremony, accepting our awards. Um, so huge kudos to a lot of different folks, um, and specifically Devin and Melissa Giedman uh, in our communications department for all the work that they do. Obviously, it shows that we're doing something right. Absolutely, well done. And, and this, is, this is all staff, right? This, this is not work that we up here on the dais have done and some great idea we've come up with. This is all staff. Staff puts these things together. Staff brings them to reality. Uh, they, they make this go. Uh, the volunteers that work with them make this go. Um, and so those awards are, yes, they're the city's awards, but they're yours and yours, and I, just, I can't thank you enough. It's, it's that kind of effort and the volunteerism that goes along with it that has been a hallmark of who this city is for the last 60 years. So very well done, and again, thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. All right, next on the list this evening, I have an announcements of upcoming city events. And who has the... Mr. James, you have the duty this evening? I've got those. Okay, so uh, to let folks know that Guadalupe County is having a town hall meeting here at the Civic Center tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, anybody who lives in Guadalupe County, we encourage you to attend that. Um, this is the Guiding Guadalupe Council, or Guiding, uh, Guiding, easy to say. It, yeah, thank you, thank you. Let's see how long it takes to get through. Guiding Guadalupe County town hall meeting conducted by GAP Strategies, um, and again, they are working on the county's strategic plan. So again, have a role in the city's, or the county's vision of the future. Friday morning, the chamber's having coffee with the chamber from 7.30 to 9.30 at the Welcome Center. We will not have a council meeting next week on the 3rd due to the 4th of July holiday. City offices are closed on the 4th of July. And then we have the 4th of July Jubilee uh, Saturday or on, on the 4th of July on Wednesday as well. That's 9.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. We do have the, the 5K run, live music, carnival parade, uh, fireworks, etc. Council has some information in your packets about that as well at the back. Um, the uh, also one of the things that we started last year that Lauren started, we didn't start, Lauren started again credit to Parks Department and folks is the 4th of July Jubilee float in fireworks from 6 to 10 p.m. So again, if you don't want to be hot out there, you want to lounge around in the pool and watch the fireworks, call in advance, talk to Sandy, get signed up. We've got a limited number of wristbands for folks um, so that you can spend that evening in the pool watching the fireworks. Uh, and then lastly, the filing for Shirts City Council election for November 6th begins July 23rd. Uh, you can talk to the City Secretary's Office, Brenda Dennis, uh, to get your name on the agenda. All right, very good. Next up, um, announcements and recognitions by the Acting City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. James? Uh, a couple that, that I've got, one I'll try to remember to do this on the front end. So again, we do some written updates for council with the packet. We don't do presentations on them. So I just want to make folks who watch the video aware of that. One is we've got sort of a bit of an, uh, an overview of the status of the recreation center bathroom remodel. We appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, we, we talk about it as part of the, the bathroom, but it really is a bit more than that. So there's an overview of what that project includes. We've got information on the 4th of July event coming up that's in there as well. And then a new item that the city secretary did is council periodically asks for staff to come back with information or presentations. And we thought so that we don't lose track of them, uh, that we would include a running list of those uh, to make sure that we captured it. We don't forget about it. You don't think we've forgotten about it. We'll have it on there each time. Um, and then the last thing is, just to let you know, part of the reason we're a little light tonight is that um, Dudley Waite is one of six folks from our EMS department um, who are on the AMBUS en route to Coriel County. Uh, there was an explosion at Coriel Memorial Hospital, um, and they're evacuating in the hospital and nearby nursing home, and they've asked for assistance. So uh, he and along with some of our firefighters are up there. I think we still have some firefighters, or EMS folks, I think we still have some firefighters who are assisting with some flooding, or are they back yet, Chief? They're back. So we had some folks out for that. But our EMS folks have now left, so keep them in your prayers. In Gatesville, yeah, in Corral County, yeah. So, 
All right, thank you, sir. Uh, next item is announcements and recognitions by the mayor. The, I just want to add on to what Mr. James said about tomorrow evening here in the City of Shirts at our Civic Center. Guadalupe County has begun the work of developing a strategic plan for the entire county. It will have effect on all cities that are in the county. It will have effect on the rural areas. It will have commentary and therefore effect on how the county is, envisions development over time. Uh, and it, and it, will, it will set the, the, the direction for how the county spends our tax debt dollars that all of us that live in Guadalupe County pay. So if you don't live in Guadalupe County, still open, may affect some things that you're interested in that are here in the Guadalupe, Guadalupe County portion of the city. If you live in Guadalupe County, I do encourage you to be there if you are able. Um, uh, having the opportunity to provide input at the outset of the development of the first strategic plan for the county um, is, is a great opportunity. So I hope everybody will be there that uh, has the time and, and inclination to do so. Uh, that said, the next thing I have on the agenda this evening is hearing of residents. And first off this evening, I have Claire Layton. Good evening to all of you. Britain's Prince William recently said that parks are important because parks make people happy. The park that makes me happy is Crescent Bend Nature Park. After FEMA bought out the flood devastated land of Lakeview Acres, Bear County took over the property. In October 2009, this land became Crescent Bend Nature Park, with the county owning the park and shirts maintaining and securing it. For many years, the park languished with minimal improvements provided by the city. Volunteers did most of the maintenance and then came Lauren Shrum. During a stream quality class held in the park, I mentioned to one of the master naturalists that I thought the park would see more improvements now that Ms. Shrum was the new assistant director of Parks and Rec. She exclaimed, you have Lauren? I knew then that the city had hired someone special. The Friends in Cres of Crescent Bend meet monthly with Ms. Shrum. In my humble opinion, she is the most competent, capable, and knowledgeable person I have ever seen in this position. The Parks and Recreation page of the short magazines attest to the program she has initiated. Whatever your interest, there is a city pro parks program for you. These programs are quality of life benefits that make shirts a great city. However, I am sure you realize that the growth of these programs, along with the increasing number of city parks necessitate more personnel. Yes, this director is superbly efficient. She understands both budgeting and how to develop short and long range, long term plans, but she also needs staff, not senior staff, but more maintenance workers. Currently, four full time and one part time and two seasonal employees maintain 23 city parks and 24 miles of hiking trails at a starting pay rate of $12.10 an hour. Do you know that the In N Out Burgers start their service workers at $13 an hour? And their employees are not required to know how to operate various types of heavy equipment or work outdoors in the Texas sun. If you want a parks and recreation department worthy of shirts, please, during this budget cycle, support the department's needs for two more maintenance workers and give them a starting salary more than a burger flipper. I realize that addressing this issue may be appropriate, more appropriate for the citizen budget input meeting, and I will raise it again then, but I feel that it's important that this needs to be presented first to council. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I can only address park side of the department, but I know that the recreation part part is no less significant. Both purport, provide important activities to your citizens. I am sure that you also realize that Church has the best park and recreation director to hold this position in 15 years. During this National Park and Recreation Month, won't you do more than acknowledge the park and recs with a proclamation? Recognize all the benefits this department contributes to the city's attractiveness as a great place to live fully support the needs of the park and recreation department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Janet Barnett. Good 
Well, good evening. I've been here before many, many years ago, and I'm back again. I am a citizen of Shirts, 10650 Bonique Drive, and that's the South Shirts, correct? I have to give a little bit of my background for you to understand where I'm going with this. And I'm going to need to turn this on and not let up. Okay, let us see. Well, I'll come to the next meeting if I don't finish. These are my new glasses so I can look you all in the eye. And then I need reading glasses. Yes. Well, a uh, picture. Um, we wanted to move to the country. We came from Camelot. When we were first married, we bought our first house and had three children. Well, Wal Walsham Road was one way in and one way out and one Dairy Queen. And on the corner, there was a barn and a picket uh, barbed wire fence. And we thought we were in the country. We were the last cul-de-sac across from Windcrest. Well, 10 years later, we couldn't get out of the subdivision. So we moved to the country. And we found this place, which it's not coming up. Oh, well, it's not clear, so what do I do? Well, it's the country, and it was 25 acres, and we had three children, and we wanted them to grow up in the country. So this is Graytown Road in Bainig, from the Bainig side looking down. Well, you know, it doesn't look like that anymore, right? Uh, originally, we were in Bear County, we were in the city of San Antonio, and we were dumb and naive. I thought I was in Judson. I was teaching there. We were in East Central. We were in the city of San Antonio. <clears throat> I had no clue that we were in the city of San Antonio. But we got our first taxes from the city of San Antonio, and they had a house on 25 acres. So there we learned about open space, correct? Because we have 25 acres. Well. Then we started fighting the city of San Antonio. We were a homeowners association, farmers, no subdivisions. He'll do it back there and focus it? Okay. All right, okay, I'll leave it alone. Well, I'm gonna run out of time, minute and a half, okay. Anyhow, um, we fought San Antonio. We'd had no fire, no police protection, and no water. So this is very ironic. I'm here about water, of all things. We got DNX from the city of San Antonio because Mayor Cisneros was on this yard. He was looking at our cisterns and having to buy water. And you know what he told me? He assured me we'd have water. You know what they did? They de-annexed us. And the city of Shirts picked us up. So I want to thank you with all my heart and soul. I don't think any of you were here then, but that was back in the 80s. So you gave us water, actually a new road. The problem came in with subdivisions. Okay. This, this is a picture of our property. Okay. And all this yellow are the high spots, and all the blue is the floodplain that runs across Graytown Road into these big, large tanks. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. Okay, the subdivision came in Laurel Ridge, Laurel Heights, I believe. That was fine, that was Bainey. Then we had this part sold out, so all this water was the only water we had ever received. We never received water from this part of the Swanson's property, which was the 104 acres around us. They had a stock tank here, which the developer destroyed. And all that water was their water from about 1948. They didn't have water. They raised seven kids from this stock tank. So they had to have water. And a pump house pumped it up to the house that was about here. Then they built a big, which I have pictures of, but I won't have time to show you right now. Right here, he built a big dam, and I assumed 
that this water would be caught because I went to the city of Schertz and I said, listen, something's going on and I, I don't like it. There's a big barricade there, okay? And he assured me that the city of Schertz had engineers that would make sure I did not receive more water at a, or at a higher velocity. Well, that's impossible with what he built. This is the subdivision. Then, and this is an unethical, immoral, and against the law, he diverted this water here about 50 yards to 100 yards up onto my property in weeds with a backhoe. Now he built a dam, and all this water comes in at the top of my property that never had a drop of water. Besides, he built a, he pushed all this land up that used to be corn, maize, and an easy flood plain that never dug any of my property out. It flowed down to our tank and across Greytown Road. Now we're receiving all the water from up here. He built a culvert about four foot wide coming from here, because he, now it's not showing here. This is an older picture. But he has a cul-de-sac here, a cul-de-sac here, a cul-de-sac here, and all the water's coming down. So the part, this part of our property, all I could see was the dam. He built all this up and constructed a dam. And that's what I saw. And I assumed it was going to be maybe a holding tank, and they let out water gradually. Does that look like a holding tank? No. And it goes to the south end of our property. And it's not here now, but coming to this coal, whatever that is he built, that big giant concrete slab, comes all this water from here, all the way over here. This was dry. All this land was below our property, and now it's all built up. So we'll be getting all the water we've always gotten, but in a narrow, narrow culvert, and all the water from up here, and all the water that went into this tank that was originally here that he destroyed and built up a cul-de-sac on there. No houses here yet. It's going directly to the corner of our property. We cannot walk on the back of this property. Of course, we're in a drought now because all this water is coming from the top and we had never received it prior to this subdivision around us. What's sad is uh, these houses here, he hauled in hundreds and hundreds of dump trucks into this, this floodplain here and he's got cul-de-sacs coming up there. And I am just worried about landfill, I don't know. But if he's gonna build houses here, even with the dam, which you wouldn't believe this one, I couldn't believe this was all happening and it happened so fast. Last year, we, uh, my husband discovered cancer, so we've kind of been incognito. This is my fence line. The land and the crops and the corn and the maize used to be below it. Now he built this, and this is the one that comes in. I, I took pictures all the way down because all of this used to be below our fence line, three or four feet, all the crops, the corn and the maize. So I just walked up and I started taking pictures. It went from that, whatever that bunker is, to that, to that, see the rocks? This is where we never had water come into our property. It was bone dry till the last time we had some rain. Ms. Janna, we'll have to ask you to, to wrap up if you could. And, and our city okay. engineer is here and okay. is in the uh, um, conference okay. room back there. And would, <laughs> I don't have and if, to come and to the next would, meeting. You would share that information with her and then she can see from her perspective as an engineer what she can observe and then can come back and brief the council as to what she sees has occurred. Okay, and you know, you're gonna be responsible for all those houses in that flat one of these days, just like you are responsible for Laurel Heights. And it's not fair to those homeowners either. I don't think this will work. I was there for the 100 year flood in 98, and I was there for the next one, and we were marooned at the top of the hill. It's not gonna work. 
not when it starts really raining. Because been there, done that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Janet. Next on the list this evening is uh, um, Clark McKesney. Oh. Evening. My name is Clark McChesney. I live at 7018 Halley Heights, Laura Heights Estates, South Shirts, that very area that we were just talking about a minute ago. Uh, I'm not here on that subject, but I can come back. <laughs> Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to address agenda item number 10, the ordinance 18T-22, the budget increase to support the recent spike in inspections, partially because of the April hailstorm. Council, my home was impacted by this storm. Right. My contractor has been at my home since first thing yesterday, Monday morning, stripping the damaged shingles and installing new underlay, or so-called felt. Perhaps you're already aware, but in case you aren't, Schertz is the only permitting authority in this area that requires a so-called felt inspection. Most roofing contractors prefer to strip and reinstall a roof in sections so that at any point in time, only a small portion of a home is subject to summer downpours. This is especially true for homes with three-story roof lines like those in much of the new construction in South Shirts. But that technique is not allowed in Shirts. The entire roof has to be removed. All the underlay or felt installed along with new drip edge and vent and pipe jacks to satisfy this inspection requirement leaving the entire house vulnerable to South Texas summer weather events. We dodged two bullets yesterday as showers approached from the southeast before they broke up at I-10 and 1518. The council memorandum for the agenda item number 10 indicates that there have been 700 re-roof permits issued in May and June up to when this document was prepared for the agenda. That's 1,400, 1,400 inspections and counting. A felt inspection and a final inspection for each permit. I inquired of staff as to why Shirts does felt inspections and Mr. James was kind enough to answer me this afternoon. But his answer doesn't give clear reasons that might not be addressed through another means like a random inspection of new contractors that have just come to work in the county, in the city. It seems to me that if there were a real requirement for this felt inspection that San Antonio, Converse, Universal City, Selma, Garden Ridge, Alamo Heights, et cetera, would also require them. So we, as homeowners, are at risk to additional damage to our homes from summer storms, something we can't control, but you can. This also creates an issue for con roofing contractors. My contractor will sideline a crew, perhaps for a day while waiting for this inspection to occur. They asked to be inspected tomorrow morning. They're still working at my house right now, but are resigned that it could be late afternoon before the inspector gets to my home. So perhaps another day exposure to the elements. Yes, the underlay or felt does provide some modest protection for heavy dew or light rain, but nothing more and certainly not a blowing pop-up thunderstorm. Council, eliminating this seemingly needless inspection will put a dent in this budget shortfall. Using the numbers I quoted previously, the result could be 700 fewer inspections. It could cut the quoted 80 inspections per day by a significant amount. It would also allow roofing contractors an opportunity to exercise due diligence and re-roof in sections keeping homes dry in unpredictable South Texas weather. And finally, the permit revenue can support other city challenges like repairing or repaving Bainig Drive, which is beginning to look like a frack road in South Texas. Council, I encourage you to inquire about the necessity of re-roof felt inspections before simply approving agenda item 10 this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on the list this evening is Diana Taylor.
Mayor, City Council members, I come to you in good faith today. I have not been here in a while, but I'm back. And I'm going down to my agenda so that I don't miss anything that my three minutes will not pass this time. First of all, I want to come to you about Columbia. We have problem on Columbus Drive. We have water sitting on Columbia Drive after it rained at 5516. On Columbia Drive, you repaired one sidewalk in front of a lady house, but the sidewalks are very, very bad. Someone is going to get hurt. If you don't take care of it, you are going to have a big problem, and it's getting really bad. And now we spoke of it before, but it's getting really, really bad. So let's take that money and spend it on our sidewalks in Fairhaven, as you can do on Shirts Parkway. The grass on 35 looks pretty bad. Are we paying money to have grass just to grow? Use your inmates, if they're in the county, to pick up grass that is left behind to pick up trash. That's what they're for. Use them. Many states use them to keep them busy. We have a problem with our trash. Our trash is picked up sometime around 4.30, 5 o'clock, due to the fact that the trucks are constantly breaking down. This is every week. We don't need the trash people to come around 4.30 or 5 o'clock when it's time to get off and people prepare their meals. So I would like for you all to address that as well because it's getting to be ridiculous now. The plants on the sidewalk, I know you all have an HOA because we have one. You have your QA, <coughs> excuse me, your QA coming out there. There's plants on the sidewalk. If someone get hurt, it's on the city because you're not supposed to have plants or trees on a sidewalk. And that's what we was told when we bought our house eight years ago. So we're gonna use the rules, let's abide by them, let's enforce them, please. Country Club, I spoke of it before. There's what you call graffiti on the side before you get into KB area. It looks pretty bad. I try to wash it down, but it's not for me to do. Speed bump, I come to you more than one time. Please help us on Columbia Drive with the speed bump. People I know for a fact are riding about 45 in the morning time, and I give you all permission. You could park in front of my house in a plain car. That's going to help your budget if you start now. And I would appreciate if you all stop the people from working on a Sunday in the homestead. New homes are being built. It is getting ridiculous because Sundays are our day to give our praise. Again, I come to you also about your police department. I feel that you don't have enough to take care of this community. We are growing each and every day. The few policemen you have on this force cannot take care of everything and everybody. Shirts are building. I also would like to say that your QA people that goes around you have all those containers that you have the lid open for the water to be covered up. Those are snake holes. There are snakes in those containers, those little holes you do to the screw. They need to cover those up. That's part of the city. That's not for the homeowners because we don't remove them. And your people that works for you all that come around, please look at your quality assurance people. I feel myself that they're not doing their job because if they were, you wouldn't have trees on the side or plants on the sidewalk because when your people come out there from the city of Shirt, they will see it. I have reported nothing's done. I have called many a times to the police department to get help on speeding. There's something going on in Shirts that I'm quite sure that where we live that needs to be taken care of. And I would like to say in my closing, and as I look at each and every one of you, everybody out here voted, except the younger one, to put you up here. And I ask that you all put your politics aside. Whatever it is you have personally, don't bring it here. 
leave it behind and take care of the community because we are paying for this. And if you don't feel that you can do the job for the community, maybe the voting should be done to have you removed. And I want to thank you all for those who have come out there to support us. Don't give up. We still got problems in Fairhaven. And I have addressed that with you. And it's time for us to take some action against Pulte because they got to come out there again next week to start looking at more homes that possibly are going to be lifted. You came when we first got started. Now we see no one. No one knows what's going out there in Fairhaven. No one knows what's going out there in Homestead. So I beg of you to get involved with the community. It's your job to take care of us and our job to make sure you get what you want by working together. Remember, a team is working together. Together, everyone can achieve the mission for shirts. But if you don't work together, you do that with them, what's in it for me? It's not going to work. And let's, again, take your politics out. And I thank you all, but that's need to go. We don't need any more politics to play games with us now. It's time to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Next on the list this evening, I have Brent Volter. Brent Bolter, 2633 Cloverbrook Lane, Belmont Park. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council, Mr. James. Uh, I just wanted to come here tonight and because I know some of you don't follow social media. So when I've come here before and brought things up, it was, oh, hadn't heard about that. So two weeks ago, we talked about a proposal from the city in regards to Wiederstein, Cibola Valley Road, that whole area. So tonight, I just wanted to pass to you that weren't following. Some of the citizens of Cibolo are not on board with what's proposed. Uh, they are actually advocating that their council members vote against the proposal. So some of us uh, spoke to some of the reasons why the proposal was made and the way that it was made. And I entertained their opinions back in a back and forth discussion. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that at least some of the citizens sit below uh, don't feel that it's a equitable situation in regards to the, to the proposal. So I'll, at the end of it, I just said, well, if your city council votes no, the city council votes no, and we can put it to rest in press. And I made them aware of the fact that within the city of Shirts, there are is bigger demand signals for other areas in regards to roads and studies that you guys have done but this was a way to help the situation get there quicker but they didn't seem to embrace that aspect of what was going on so having said that the only thing i'm going to make a pitch for is those of us that are in belmont park and riata are still all about do something with old wiederstein okay and especially as we get closer to the development with Evo and everything going in there, uh, I talked to Mr. James tonight, and at some point there's going to be, you know, some connecting roads in that area to Old Wiederstein that for us will be, we're going to zip down there, all of us Belmont Park, be out of folks to go, uh, to go uh, entertain the businesses there. So if that whole situation is taken care of, we can zip down there, go see a movie, go bowling and then uh, come back out on the access road and sit back home. And that would be awesome. So if this whole Wiederstein, Cibolo Valley Road goes to not, and I don't know that it is, uh, but I just wanted to make you aware that there's at least some citizens in Cibolo that are not on board, at least with what was proposed two weeks ago. So I wanted to make you aware. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, next on the list this evening, I have uh, Dana Eldridge. Okay, Mr. Eldridge says no need this evening. Um, and next up, Jim Fowler. Mr. Fowler. Fair enough. Good to see you, sir. And then uh, lastly, John Sullivan.
How y'all doing? Good. <laughs> no, you can't respond. Uh, 513 Triple Crown, John Sullivan. Um, I just want to come up here and uh, thank you for recognizing Parks and Recreation. It's such a significant aspect to the city government that touches every resident and as your proclamation said, helps to fuel our economic engine to attract high paying jobs, build wealth in our community. And in my mind, we always will get back more than we put into it. But I have to tell you, uh, I really am very excited about the current progress in energy in the Parks Department um, with amazing staff that go way well above and beyond um, anything we can really hope for. So that, that's exciting. But I'm also at the same time concerned and tempered a little bit because I know the city is still very low on staffing levels in the Parks Department compared to you know, cities of our size and the funding is not there to really make some of the strategic investments in staffing and facilities as our city grows so fast. Um, I'm looking forward to the workshop tonight. Uh, there are so many gaps in our recreational programming and needs and facilities that are well beyond their prime. I would really like to see the city take a more active role in recreational programming to better serve residents and identify gaps between um, all the different community organizations. One of the things I hear a lot is like, where do I go for this? Or There's just all these different organizations and there's not really, it's a little bit confusing. One sport's here, one sport's there, that kind of thing. Often, uh, really the easiest answer does not always provide the most value and the best return on investment to, to citizens. And um, while we really do, as was stated earlier, I mean, Lauren's a fantastic, like, next generation parks thinker as far as, you know, we're lucky to have that in shirts right now. And um, let's take advantage and give her the resources to do great things for our community. Um, so in closing, um, thanks for your support. And let's remember investment in parks and recreation will bring a greater return on investment for a city growing as fast as we are. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right, um, next item that I have on the agenda this evening, we have our consent agenda items. On the consent agenda this evening, we have uh, minutes, uh, consideration and or action regarding the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 12, 2018. Item number two, resolution 18R63, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing EMS debt revenue adjustments, utility billing debt revenue adjustments, and Shirts Magazine debt revenue adjustments for certain inactive outstanding receivables and other matters in connection therewith. Item number three, resolution 18R68, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a mutual aid agreement with the cities of Cibolo, Live Oak, New Braunfels, Shirts, and Selma, and other matters in connection therewith. Item number four, resolution 18R69, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a mutual aid agreement with the cities of Cibolo, Converse, Garden Ridge, Live Oak, Shirts, Selma, and Universal City, and other matters in connection therewith. Item number five, resolution 18R70, resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, approving and authorizing an agreement for a right of way dedication along Eckert Road from uh, Carriari Holdings Incorporated acceptance of such right of way dedication by the city in accordance with the terms of the dedication agreement and other matters in connection therewith. Item number six, resolution 18R71, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing additional expenditures with Ford Engineering, totaling no more than $2,600 for professional engineering services to obtain sidewalk easements for the Shirts pedestrian routes and bike lanes project. And item number seven, resolution 18R41, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing purchases with computer solutions in an amount not to exceed $78,774.47 for the hardware and installation services associated with the virtualization project and new community development software project and other matters in connection therewith. Are there any of these that need to be pulled out and considered individually? Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Edwards. Item number three, um, just a description between the mutual aid and the automatic aid that we're actually doing, if Chief Hansen could address that. And we'll, uh, we'll take item number three outside of consent. Any others? If not, is there a motion to approve the items on consent with the exception of item three? So moved. Second. A motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Gutierrez. Any other comments or questions for counsel? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven eyes, no nays. The motion carries. We'll go to item number three, resolution 18R68, resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a mutual aid agreement with the cities of Cibolo, Live Oak, New Braunfels, Shirts, and Selma, and other matters in connection therewith. Chief? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Yes, this, there are various MOUs and, and uh, agreements in place that, that handle the majority of what we do with the other cities. What this specifically addresses is the ability for us to uh, do some ad hoc task force such as a DWI task force or interdiction 
And then what do we do if that does produce some sort of seizure or things like that? So, so none of the other agreements have that, and that was the purpose for these two. So I was wondering because we talked about automatic aid versus mutual aid, so that's why I was asking that question. All right. Anyone else? Question for Chief? I'll move from the chair that we approve resolutions 18R68. Second. second. All right, motion from the chair, second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments or questions from council? Now I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have seven ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Next item that we have on the agenda this evening, we have Ordinance 18M20, an ordinance by the City of Shirts, authorizing and amending City Council Rules of Conduct and Procedure, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance and providing an effective date. It's final reading, uh, this change of the rules, uh, setting forth that the Chair will not entertain uh, objection to items being requested to be placed on a future agenda by members of Council. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve Ordinance Number 18M20. Second. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mr. Mayor, Harris? I'd like to submit a I'd like to submit a motion to make a substitute for Article Six Six One Item F. And I have the sus the substitute right here in hand. If I may read it. Okay. My substitute reads as follows. When an objection to place an item on the agenda is presented, council should quickly defer the objection and call the question. The chair puts the question by saying, those in favor of the objection say aye, those opposed say nay. If a simple majority of yay votes are made, the objection on the objection, uh, the item is omitted from the agenda. If the majority is nay, then the item is placed on the next available agenda. I have copies here for my colleagues to read. Mr. Mayor, point of information? Yes, sir, Mr. Gutierrez. Three points I need clarification on. I shall do my best. Okay. As it stands, without this substitute, if Councilman Z, if Council Member Z were to request a document staple day, and I offer an objection, the chair will indicate the objection is out, out of order and the item will be placed on the next available agenda. Is that correct? That is, that is correct if this okay. motion passes and the rules are changed as currently written. Point number two then. Document staple day will be on the next agenda under discussion and, discussion and action items, say item number seven. I therefore, during the meeting, may request an amendment to the agenda and remove item number seven. The chair will then call the question, depending on the vote, the agenda item may or may not be removed. Is that correct? Give me a minute to think about that. I've not been posed with that question before. So I think your question is, um, if once we were in session, if a motion was made by a member of council that a certain item not be taken up, um, that would probably be out of order. I think the appropriate motion would be at the time that the, uh, um, the item came forward that that council member would make a motion to end debate. And if the uh, council agreed and there was a two-thirds vote to end debate, uh, then no action would be taken and no discussion would occur. And the agenda item will be left on the for it, discussion? It, it, or? Would, it would not, if, if the motion was made to end debate, uh, at the beginning of the, after I read the caption, if there is a caption, or after I introduce the item, and there was a two-third vote to end debate, then the motion, there, I mean, then the, the item would not be considered, would not be discussed, no action would be taken. Okay, so then, therefore, my point number three, if the substitute was in effect, we would simply be addressing this item now and not in the future agenda, therefore saving the secretary some time and Councilman Member Z, three days to prepare for his presentation. So I'm going to um, 
I'm going to reread your substitute because I haven't seen it before this evening, and so I need to make sure that I understand and make sure that the substitute itself would not cause a, um, a challenge in the rules or a challenge in Open Meetings Act provisions. <clears throat> So I do understand the uh, substitute. I would have to ask the city attorney. Do you have a copy? Oh, he's not here this evening. Okay. No, it does not mean we can do anything we want. I, I think that in my seeking guidance previously, um, where I asked how to handle objections, the city attorney advised me at that time that taking a vote on an item that was not previously on, placed on the agenda, even though it be a, um, an, a discussion around whether or not, even if there's no discussion around whether or not to place that item on a future agenda, that it would be problematic to hold a vote, which is why I set it up where if there was an objection, it would, then we would have a discussion posted in a subsequent meeting, um, because have, having a vote on an item that has been brought up in the meeting but not posted um, potentially puts the public in a position of not having prior notice, and that could be problematic with regard to the Open Meetings Act. And so that's why um, I had it set up the way that I did. Um, I think we might have a problem there, but it might be manageable. Um, we might have to have some additional boilerplate language put on our agendas that clearly lets the public know that we might vote on whether or not to put something on a future agenda. I'd have to visit with the city attorney. Sorry for the lengthy answer. Can we therefore postpone uh, item number eight for the next uh, for the next meeting? All right. Are you making a motion to postpone item number eight until our next meeting? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, we have to dispose of the first motion. No. Motion and a second already. Mm, we'll get to that. We will have to be when when we have multiple motions. Um, we have to take them in reverse order, provided that there are in fact. Um, seconds made. So I have a motion from Councilman Gutierrez to postpone item number eight until our next regular meeting. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion dies for lack of a second. I have a motion on the floor from Councilmember Gutierrez offering a substitution to the rule change um, that is uh, uh, outlined in Ordinance 18M20. Uh, is there a second? Not hearing a second, the motion dies for lack of a second. And we have a motion and a second from Mr. Edwards, seconded by Dr. Kaiser, uh, that we approve Ordinance 18M20. Any other comments, questions from Council? If not, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Nay. Nay. have five ayes and two nays, the motion carries. All right. Item number nine, resolution 18R72, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the acting city manager to extend the contract with Celrico Services in the amount of $20,000 to provide the congregate meal program at the Shirts Area Senior Center. Good evening. Evening, Ms. Shrum. How are you? Hi, I'm well. So, um, item tonight, as you recall, uh, back in August of 2017, we came before Council. Um, to award the contract for the congregate meal program at the Shirt Service Senior Center. That contract was awarded to Celrico Services. Um, at that time, we were with a different provider previously, and we were only averaging about 65 meals per day. Uh, with that new provider, we anticipated that uh, service would increase, taste would increase, um, and all those would increase our numbers. Also, we just completed the renovation of the Senior Center. So we were anticipating that increase, however, we did not anticipate um, 
the increase that we're seeing today. So we're averaging about 100 mils today. Um, there has been a little bit of fine tuning that we've been working on because of the, the program requirements. We now have to order a little bit further in advance than we did previously. So we're working with our seniors and we've narrowed that down where we don't have as many overages anymore. Um, but we are still going to go over uh, potentially before the end of the fiscal year in September. And I am set to be out uh, due to maternity leave. So we want to come to you in advance and let you know that we would probably be hitting that cap in September timeframe. So we're asking for an additional 10,000 to be added to the contract for this fiscal year and for next to cover those um, increases in meals. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those now. Very good. Council questions? Mr. Crawford? Mr. Chairman, out of curiosity only, is the price still 415? Yes, that's correct. So at the end of this contract, right? The price per, con per meal is still the same in the contract. Okay, it's thank a two-year contract, okay. so we're just increasing the amount we can spend per year. Thank you. Mr. Larson? What happens if attendance continues to increase? Good question. So we've been exploring those options that we mentioned previously, where we were going to look to cost share um, with the city of Cibolo. And uh, Mr. James has been in some discussions with those members, uh, city management and Cibolo. He can speak to that. We, in looking at the numbers, we think about 20% of the membership of the senior center, the folks who show up and the folks who eat the meal, um, live in the city of Cibolo. Just over 50% are Schertz residents. Um, with the exception of Universal City, it's a little bit higher. Most of the rest of the communities, two, three percent, thing, things like that. So, um, I've had conversations with the city manager. I have had a letter halfway done on my computer for two weeks, probably, to get to Bob Herrera officially to request that they contribute about fifty thousand dollars a year starting this year to the cost of the senior center um, going forward. So, I guess in answer to the question of if the meal numbers continue to go up. Um, they're, they're good problems to have and bad problems to have. In a way, that's probably a good problem. As the numbers grow, we probably need to revisit the program more broadly because, again, the expansion has helped, but we get tight on space. The classes get a bit too full, things like that. Um, we probably need to look at what we do long term going forward. But right now, the, the idea is to approach um, the city of Cibolo for funding. Uh, to go that route going forward to offset the cost to keep the cities from rising uh, next year. And actually, in theory, it'll, it'll save us money if they contribute that. Uh, we're hopeful they will. Um, again, they contribute money to the Schertz Library as well that's substantial that they don't have to because of the county funding. Um, so we're optimistic about that. And like I said, uh, city manager and I have spoken a number of times. Um, his initial reaction wasn't negative toward it. So. All right, anyone else? Mr. Mr. Oh. Or Mr. Davis. Mr. James, what, what did you say the city's participation rate was as far as membership? Oh, in terms of membership, city of Cibolo is about 20%. City of Schertz is about 55%. Um, and then we have folks that sort of come and go. One of the issues, I think, on some of the membership is we get folks who come and visit or they come down for the holiday and they're kind of in and out. Um, so it's, yeah, it's surprisingly, you would think a larger percentage would be Schertz residents, um, and they're not. It's it's about 55% on the meal, um, but I would bet a lot of the kind of drop-in sort of folks, and I don't know if the seniors would nod out there or disagree, a lot of the folks that kind of drop in that may not be members, don't come regularly, don't eat meal, are probably more Schertz residents, but in terms of the membership and meals, it's it's about 55%. It's not as high as you'd think. Correct. And Sorry, I was just going to clarify. And this is this is people who are participating in the meal. There is membership separate for the senior center, and those percentages are a little bit different. So, um, is are there? I guess my point is, are there any other cities that are approaching Cibolo's participation rate that we need to look at having an agreement with? No, I, as I recall, Universal City is about eight yes. um, percent. That's the that's the closest. Everybody is two or three percent. One of the issues is some of those other cities have senior center facilities, and so likely if we were to approach, for example, San Antonio, they'd go. Yeah, we got our own that we pay for. We have your folks, this, that, and the other. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's fair to say that it's surprising the number of folks that are not Schertz residents with the meal program in particular. It's not a, it's our folks are lower than you might think. Thank you, Mr. Larson. I'm sorry. Can you clarify? Because I I did look at the packet, but I'm thinking I got the numbers wrong. 
Are, when you say you're asking Cibolo to contribute $50,000, is that for the two-year contract? So, so no, what we're going to do is the request is for the fiscal 18-19 year to ask Cibolo to contribute $50,000 to senior center operations because of the number of Cibolo residents that both eat meals and participate in the activities at the senior center. So that $50,000 reflects other programs outside the meal program? So what we're, yeah, to be, to be clear, we're, we're asking at Cibolo essentially for just, hey, here's this total cost that we have to run the senior center in terms of the YMCA contract, the meal program, we have capital costs for repair, we have utility costs for operations and things like that. Here's kind of what that comes out to. This is sort of the percentage your residents are, particularly with kind of the meal program that are regularly coming. We'd like you to kick in $50,000. To be clear, it's not a, I haven't done a whole bunch of math and computations to arrive. It's, it's a round number based on generally kind of a level of participation um, that we've got going forward. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. You know, this is a, pro a program that we think that we would want to have grow. And, and, and let me explain. When, when Emma Lazarus wrote the, 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 the new Colossal and she put on there, on the base of the Statue of Liberty, give us your tired, give us your poor, guys, that means a lot. I grew up very poor. I mean, I grew up in Hunter McIver homes. I know what it's like to pinch a dollar. I know what it's like to stretch it out. So I think this is a program that we want to actually see expand. Some of these people have worked their whole lives and they've given. We're watching the greatest generation pass on. So for us to mince and pinch a penny, I understand saving money, I understand that. But we, we have an obligation to our seniors in this community. We have an absolute obligation, not just this community. We should want this program to be so great that everybody wants to come to it and everyone wants to emulate it and guess what? If they imitate us and they try to go out and create it, they say, you know what, Shirts does it a lot better than we can. Let's just help them with their community center or their senior center. I really do believe, I really do believe that that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So I, I've said enough on that. I think we should go forward. We should ask Cibolo, not only should we ask Cibolo, but to Mr. Davis's point, we should ask Selma. We have residents. Are we tracking this? We say we're data and matrix driven. Where are the, where are the citizens coming from? Because those are the cities that we, are to, we ought to be sending Mr. James and, and the mayor over to saying, hey guys, we're taking on a lot of your burden. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Church has always said, man, we're the beacon on the hill, right? We're, we're the leaders in the community. We're, we're, the, we're the greatest thing that happened on Northeast San Antonio, right? Right, we're the biggest thing. Why not? Let's, let's continue to be that way. You know, we lead, we, we lead. We're the tip of the spear. We're the vanguard. Let's lead from, we're leading. That's, that's okay. And we are tracking those numbers now, so that's good. We have all that data, so we can go to the other cities if we need to. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? Not is there a motion to approve 18R72? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Gutierrez. Yes. Well, Mr. Larson. I, yes, I, 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 feel like, I feel like I always owe an explanation for my vote. And it's really kind of, there's a lot of pressure looking at the green shirts um, out there. And I do support Parks and Rec. <laughs> uh, but I have to be true to myself. And, you know, when I look at this expense for the free meals, I think that our seniors do deserve it. And I think it's a great program. I just don't think it should be funded by the city. I think... Um, this, there's a, and I don't want to get too deep into the philosophical debate because I know I'm on, probably on the, on the minority side here tonight, but th the reality is when governments take over charity, it has a real impact on the community connection with the individuals who are, are benefiting from these programs. And when the governments get involved in free lunch programs, it takes away a personalized matter, level to it. And it does really change the fabric of, of how you look at, at helping your neighbor. So there's a, a moral argument to be said there that um, there's a negative moral consequence of mandating these kind of programs through government taxation. But beyond that, there's simply a financial reality that as a community, we're not able to meet our most fundamental obligations. We just raised... Um, what might be the biggest tax fee increase in the history of shirts because we're unable to meet our obligations in maintaining roads. We have a phenomenal parks department, but Pickerel Park sunshades have been gone for almost a year because of a resource problem. I, my understanding is they're going to be here soon and installed, but it's the middle of summer. Uh, we have 
uh, I called code compliance for uh, basically we thought someone having a garage sale four months ago because every piece of furniture they owned was on their lawn and it's still there. And now there's piles of ashes and trash and weeds a foot high. I called code compliance and they said we're swamped and they told me it'd be a week before they get there. So there's a real resource problem where the city has an obligation to meet its fundamental basic requirements and the fact is we're not there yet. And um, I think that we can partner with local nonprofits, religious organizations, ind private individuals. I'll be the first to sign up with a monthly donation. Uh, but, but this is something that would be more effectively funded through nonprofits, religious organizations, and, and private donations. And so I, I don't say that thinking I'm going to sway anybody's vote or anyone's mind. I say that because I feel as a representative I'm obligated to, to share my thoughts with you and you can tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, but that's, that's all I've got. Mr. Davis? Yeah, I, I've got to chime in, and I, I want to make sure that Councilman Larson doesn't feel like he's uh, the lone man on the island here. Uh, I like the fact that Schertz leads the way in many, many things. But the reality of it is, like he perfectly stated, we only have so many dollars coming in. We only have so many dollars coming in, and we have a lot of requirements. And we heard residents tonight talk about we want and we need more police officers. We heard some of the folks that are out there and wearing green shirts tonight talk about how we need more park workers. Well, the, re the, the, re the sad reality of it is we can't do everything. Uh, I'm all for the senior program, always have been, um, and, and I support the, the meal program. I'm going to support this issue tonight, but like I said before, I think, I think we need to keep on staying on the path in our community where we're looking at doing things smartly. And, and the reality of it is, just like with the library, we have the state-of-the-art library in the region, but we have it resourced from not only our city, but the county and other entities. And this is another example of there's nothing wrong with having the best senior program in the Northeast, but if the program is being used by all of the communities around us, then we need to engage with them. And we need to make sure that, that they're doing their fair share to put on this quality event. Because if they're not, then that's more police they're putting on their streets or more firemen they're putting in their firehouses. And at some point, that's going to impact our city when we can't take care of our other departments. So again, I, I don't think Mr. Larson is, is totally out of line with his logic. I think this is something that is a fantastic program. I think we need to keep on bearing this torch and, and, and setting the standard for the Northeast. But at the same token, we have to be smart about this and we have to make sure that we're using every avenue that we can, whether it be outside support agencies, talking with our local communities, Cibolo, Universal City, Selma. Um, if, 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 if their folks are going to come use our facilities, then that's fine. But there's a cost associated with that. And we, gotta, we have to be able to capture that, those numbers. Uh, Mr. Crawford? As Mr. Larson stated and Mr. Davis, I feel somewhat the same way to the extent that I don't want to say no tonight and I won't. But I might, I am willing, and I've talked to, I talk to Mr. James almost every week we have counsel about why are we putting money here, why are we putting money there, how do we get our roads fixed, how do we get other things done, how do we take care of parks, recurring themes. And spoke with the mayor this afternoon a few minutes about doing some stuff with some money. And we, we don't have enough money to do everything, but I'm not about to say no to this for a whole lot of good reasons. But I will ask Mr. James if we could, I'm not sure how to say we, but what Mr. Davis said about other agencies getting involved like we do with the library, and that seemed to have worked out pretty well, certainly the 10 years or so that I've been involved, or at least been around. So maybe we, maybe we should look at some other avenues, kind of like dealing with Cibolo to pay for some of the meals. 20% uh, for Cibolo, 55% for shirts, at least 25%. That's another $50,000 from someplace. Eight of it goes to Universal City, 17% is left over. So maybe we should look at doing some of these things, kind of willingly, not forcing people. Just a comment that we can look, maybe we can look at the next year, and maybe we can offset some of the costs a little bit more. Uh, 
Thank you. Mr. Edwards? You know, if we're going to be, if we're going to track everything, I talked to Mr. Waite the other day, and we talked about being data and matrix driven, and we talked about maybe monitoring every vehicle to see what vehicles are idling, seeing what, how much fuel we're spending, seeing what vehicles are going on trips around the city, all those things. If we're going to do manpower, let's bring in a manpower specialist and say, okay, are you really swamped? Let, let's ask that question. Because someone can say they're swamped. So let me give you a definition. Uh, a guy came to train me one day at my office, and he said, you know, Cedric, moving paper from one side of your desk to the other side of your desk, you're very busy. You're very busy. But when a manpower specialist came out to see me, he said, moving paper from one side of your desk to the other side of your desk while completing a task is productive. There's a difference. So I don't want us to mince words, but if, if we're interested in bringing people out to, to do a manpower study, I don't have a problem with that. Let, let's do that too. If, if we're saying we're spending too much money on seniors who've dedicated their lives to, to, to working and providing and now they're on a fixed income and we have an issue with that, you know, I, I do have a problem saying let's just Oh, we just bypass that and go on to something else. Anyone else? And thus we get to see the dilemma that uh, city councils get to deal with. Not enough money to do all the things that we want to do, and how do we spend them and make those difficult decisions? Uh, that said, I have a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions from council? And none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Nay. Six ayes and one nay. Motion carries. Next item we have on. Thank you, ma'am. Next item that we have on the agenda is item number 10, Ordinance 18T22, an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a budget adjustment to the fiscal year 2017 2018 budget to increase the budget for third party inspection services, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance and providing an effective date. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Council. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I'm Lisa Wood. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And uh, uh, I wanted to talk to you this evening about a uh, request for a budget adjustment to increase the budget for our third party inspection services. So the Building Inspections Department uh, Division is requesting an increase in the budget to allow for our continued third party review services. In July of 2015, <clears throat> the city contracted third party review service inspection service to deal with the challenges that we've been having when it comes to our timely and thorough reviews uh, for and our inspections and the increased number of inspections um, compounded by some vacancies we've had in the building inspections department of hiring an inspector. Um, initially, when we contracted these services, our goal was just to um, take care of the peaks and valleys for our workload to avoid, uh, avoid those delays in service for our customers. Our goal is to provide the best customer service we can. So we do a lot of different things to try to do that. We've, you know, we've provided kiosks. We've worked with y'all to, to, you know, to try to get software to improve our efficiencies to provide the best customer service we can. We offer inspections almost same day, basically. Somebody can call them in at 6 a.m. and we go out and do them. We have had a very high influx uh, of permits. And um, I have a few slides here to kind of show you. Um, and I'm, I apologize, my uh, revenues in my little line chart here um, don't have the dollar signs and the uh, commas. So uh, last year, as you can see, we've had a, a steady increase in permit activity as well as a steady increase in revenues for permits. Um, you know, a lot of the increase you'll see uh, from 2015 and 16 to, to through the 2016-17 budget year are a lot of commercial projects. We had some very complex commercial projects through here. So currently, you see on the uh, right hand, as of today, it's a little different than your report, and I didn't think about it when I was creating this. I probably should have just used the same numbers. But as of today, uh, the department has generated $2,572,114 and a few cents in change in revenue. As of today, probably about 3 o'clock when I ran this report. Um, we still have three months left in the year, and um, currently um, we're a little bit more than $500,000 over our projected revenues from what we projected at the beginning of the year. 
Um, and then just so everybody knows, we have 18 commercial projects that are in, that are actually in our office under review, and they all have building permit fees that total in the uh, range of $250,000 in permit revenues. So we're, we're expecting to see those revenues. And, and as you know, we, some of these projects have been fairly complex. Um, the EVO project is a complex project. It was a very large project, and it's going to take a lot of inspections throughout the process. Um, Additionally, we can see that we've had a rise in our permits. Um, one of the things that it's the way our new software or our new software will work, but different in the old software is that we do also with our permits, we try to put them all on one form for folks. So we have a project permit that we might have five permits associated with it. So these numbers are when a project comes through, they have a plumbing permit, electrical permit. Those all get added so that they just get one piece of paper out of convenience for the customer. Um, uh, as of today, or as of last week when I ran the report, we've done 347 single-family residential homes. Last year, the entire year, we did 399. So we're kind of on track to probably beat our record, or our kind of record for last year, which was, a, which was somewhat of a record. Um, we're 71 homes higher than we were last year. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 18 new commercials under review. And then the balance of that is kind of miscellaneous permits, electrical, plumbing, roofing, et cetera. Um, so as you can see, and I think you've gotten a, a memo before, we actually have had a large increase in our uh, re-roof permits. Um, the roofing permits that we're seeing is not just in the southern portion of town. It's very widespread throughout the city. I mean, it's pretty much central all the way southern. Um, and so we've had a very large increase. Now this is actually not fiscal year, this is calendar year. Um, so you can see that basically this year we've issued alone 947 re-roof permits. Um, and I know that there was, there's questions about some of the inspections and I think um, Mr. James had sent out an email, but just so everybody understands, we do do two inspections. We do a felt inspection and a final inspection. And we do that because we think that's a quality inspection for our customers. They pay for a permit and they expect quality from us. And so that's what we do. We go out and we ensure that, that the shingles are and the roof is prepared according to the specifications on each of those shingles. We have a requirement. Building code has a requirement of how many years they need to be and their specification associated with each of those. And so we actually go out and make sure that according to code, you can you know, put this, the right amount of felt because you have the ability to put additional layers of felt. We go out and ensure that the felt's not torn and hopefully that the decking underneath, the, the wood decking that's underneath is not damaged. And they can actually tell some of that, and I'm not an inspector, um, but ultimately, it's my understanding from the building official that they can tell some of that through the, the way that the, the nails and there's some little, what are those called, Brian? I'm sorry. There's some little round things. Tin caps. Down. What is it? Tin caps. Okay. Those tin caps are down and not damaging the felt so that water would seep through on the roof. And we have, you know, during this time period, I will tell you, we've, we've had a lot of calls. There's a lot of roofers out there doing things that they're not supposed to. They're not registered. They're not getting their permits. They're not even pulling felt off. They're, they might have multiple layers of felt and putting shingles on. And so we're, you know, part of this is us trying to perform a quality inspection. So, so maybe since this is raised, we'll pause a moment because I think it's a, it's a valid point that Mr. McChesney raised. And again, as Lisa said, it's not the first time we've heard this complaint. And so maybe just to give you something to think about. Um, I think, I think, you know, he makes a valid, Mr. McChesney made a valid point, which is, you know, what it means is we're coming out midway through the process and that that means the contractor can't start and just go as quick as they can to finish. It means we're doing more inspections associated with that. There are concerns for rain. So we have some contractors going, yeah, I'm not starting it yet because it looks like rain's coming in and we've got this felt inspection. You know, what the city does typically with these things are, as Lisa said, there are requirements in the building code that, that stipulate how the construction is to be done or what the standard is. So for instance, you see it said if there's water damage, those water damage pieces of material, the wood, for example, per code is supposed to be removed and replaced. As she said as well, you can typically, depending on the slope of the roof, you can come and just not rip off the old felt and you can put down a second layer of felt over it. Now, if the slope's not appropriate, you can't do that. You've got to pull that original layer of felt off 
But if you've already placed that second layer of felt over, and again, it's, it's a challenge with ages of homes, and again, I'm empathetic to folks having a new roof done every few years, but you can't put a third layer of felt down over it. And so, the, the and then as Lisa said, the issue is the nail sticking up and not being pulled and things like that. So very clearly, let me be clear, there are drawbacks to us doing this felt inspection. It's more work for our staff, particularly when we get these events like hail storms. It's a delay in the process of construction. It can be an inconvenience for a homeowner who wants to kind of be there when the process is going on. You have the challenges of rain. Don't doubt that folks may say, hey, if you're doing work insurance, because we've got this bit of delay, I'm gonna start charging a little bit more for this as well. Our folks feel like despite those negatives for doing that, that it makes sense to do this felt inspection because of the importance of those things that they're looking for. And, and frankly, it's because of the number of times that they found their problems. If this was something that, yeah, it's a requirement, but they didn't tend to ever find problems with it, th there's probably not a need to go out and do that inspection because it's rare that you would have an issue or maybe the issue wouldn't create a severe problem. From our perspective, we feel like, again, if we've got homeowners who are coming in saying, I'm putting on a roof, this roof is supposed to last 20, 30, 40 years, again, unless we get another hailstorm, that this added inspection really does make a difference in the process. But again, I want to be very clear, there are trade-offs associated with this, as with so many things, um, and certainly you make trade-offs, you deal with that. Again, not trying to give an explanation as to why we do this and we are cognizant of the fact that there are drawbacks to this, particularly our inspectors who are scrambling to do so many inspections associated with it, um, but that support this as well going forward. So for what it's worth, just to maybe address in more depth that issue. So, um, so he, see, did I go the wrong direction? Yes, I did, sorry about that. And so then here's our number of permits that we've seen happen over the last um, five years and so uh, basically um, what we're expecting this year is at least over 20,000 permit uh, inspections this year I mean it's it's hard to project completely out because we don't know how it seems like we've gone through two almost three we're going into two months and we haven't really slowed down on getting those roof permits so I'm not quite sure how long that's gonna last but it looks like just with the new home construction commercial construction and all the miscellaneous construction and as we grow we're looking at probably over 20,000 inspections um, this this coming this year 2018 um, so um, so staff has been working to find a, a long-term solution for this and and I, I know that that council has seen some of those uh, solutions like the software we're hoping to gain efficiencies um, with the new software not just in permitting but in inspections also because there's a mobile version of that so we're hoping to gain some of those efficiencies but that doesn't account for the drive time that we have you know it takes a long time to drive from one end of the city to the other even if we put folks in um, uh, regions they still we accommodate all of our homeowners so we have homeowners that need to stay home for us to come in and do a water heater inspection we want to make sure that we meet their schedule so when they call us and ask us we might have to reroute our schedules to make sure that, that we take care of those things for them. Uh, we do our best to make all the accommodations that we can. So we've been working to find a long-term solution to the challenges created by these um, permit activities. And our goal was to shorten the times and stabilize our, our plan review times and inspection times, um, and then provide that thorough quality review and inspection. Um, so over the last five years, uh, council has approved two positions for the department. We've had a uh, inspector position approved in the 2014-15 budget year. It was a mid-year um, uh, position. And then in 17-18, uh, we had the plans examiner um, position to kind of help with that and deal with that high influx of permits that were coming through. Um, we have had some challenges filling the building inspection position. We were we had really been looking for a qualified applicant so that they could just hit the ground running. Somebody that has the certifications, the licensings that they need. Um, but we're gonna we've started with a new approach um, over the last few weeks. Um, we actually 
Uh, one of the inspectors we have is certified. Our plans examiner is licensed and certified as well. And, and unfortunately, he has not been able to do his plans examiner position full time because he spends a lot of time doing inspections with the high influx of inspections that we have as well. Um, and so we're looking at the, the possibility of, like the last gentleman we hired, he had some construction experience, but he didn't have any licensing or, uh, as a matter of fact, the last two, because our plans examiner is the same way. Um, training those folks, um, whether it's in the field training with our building official, sending them to classes to try to get them where they need to be. But for an inspector, it takes several years for that to happen. Um, they don't just learn that stuff real, you know, like real fast. It's a lot of training and it's a lot of on the job um, work. Gil will tell you, yeah, a good inspector, it takes probably, you know, four to five years is what his, you know, our, our building official would say. So um, we've had those, uh, those challenges. And then I think in the packet you see that um, I provided you kind of the recommended what our ISO, which is our rating company for the insurance, um, has suggested or recommended of uh, per inspections per day, as well as I've been reviewing the Zucker report from Austin where this company came down and reviewed the, the um, department, their development service department, and provided them feedback on what they could do to improve their services. And so um, over the last couple years, I picked some of it up and read it, and there are things that, that apply to any development services department, and the recommendations for them were the same. Our inspectors that both suggested um, 15 inspections a day to get that quality inspection to still be able to do training and learning um, and gaining knowledge. Um, our inspectors typically always do more than 15 inspections a day. And at times when those inspections are those 15 minute inspections like a water heater or a roof felt inspection, then we can, we can get more than 15 in a day. You know, it's those larger complex projects that sometimes take a little bit longer. So, um, so as part of the long-term solution, staff is requesting more um, staff for um, the department um, for next year's budget for review. Um, and then as a result of everything I've just told you, staff is requesting um, an increase in our uh, budget of $100,000 for additional inspection service. It'll be funded out of the additional revenue. As I uh, provided you earlier, we're at least $500,000 over our projected revenues. Um, and uh, we, we expect to have more coming in over the next three months. Uh, it'll be funded by that additional revenue and it will not have a decrease in our general fund balance at all. So um, with that, questions? Then maybe to be clear, if council were to approve this tonight, when it comes back for second reading, we would have an associated item to increase the amount we can spend with the contract firms that do the inspection. So we need the money and the approval to do more. All right, council, questions, staff? Mr. Edwards? So, so the contract firms, are, are they just extremely busy because of all the storms that have come through? Because we've had several significant storms come through the area. So uh, the nice thing about our third party services and I'm assuming that when you say contract firms, yes. yeah, are, they have multiple staff members that they're able to send out. And so when we uh, have a high influx, they'll send out more inspectors out to our area because they do work for other cities. Um, so do they have a high influx? Yeah, from us. <laughs> and I'm assuming other cities as well, but they have more folks on their staff to be able to send out. So I'm assuming that our inspections department, when they're going out to, to see these roofing um, companies and what they've done, they're finding some significant problems or problems that just, they're not cut, they're not up to standard. So I will say on the roofing permits, um, when we get complaints, and we've had a few complaints on the roofing, our building official actually goes out. And I will say on the roofing also, our newest inspector is doing those inspections for the uh, roofing because there are certain inspections that you have to be licensed to perform. So a plumbing inspection has to be form, performed by somebody who has a plum, uh, plumbing inspector license. So we can't just send anybody out to do any inspections by state law. Okay. And so, um, so the third party services are not doing most of those felt inspections and final roof inspections. It's our newest inspector and they're performing our more complex uh, final reviews because that's, to be honest with that's where we get the more bang for the buck. We get them out there to do these multi um, inspections and they charge us less for that one inspection instead of 
more for each single little inspection. Thank you. Very good, Mr. Crawford. Ms. Woods, I spoke with Brian this afternoon about this issue, or this item, not so much an issue. And I've had some developers talk with me in the last year and some builders both. And they're, they're, those comments were strictly, we need more inspectors, we need more inspectors. It takes a long time to get stuff done, longer than we want. It's typical kind of things a builder and developer will say. I have no reason not to believe them. And I feel we need more inspectors. I feel we need to have, we're spending enough, we're spending 200 plus thousand dollars contracting it out. And I don't think the city of Church is going to stop growing. And if it is going to stop growing, we don't know what month, day, or year. So I, when I was talking to Brian earlier this afternoon, it's like, okay, Brian, maybe two inspectors and somebody to help with the plans. And that's not what this is about tonight, but it kind of is because we're spending a lot of money contracting things out for services we need pretty regular and have needed for the last five years, basically, when, I, when you first talked to us about using contractors in P&Z. So I'm hoping that when we get to the budget side, we can help make an improvement on the number of inspectors so things are done in a timely manner. And I know they'll be done, they sh they'll be done properly. So we need the money and we need to get off the contract and more onto the we own and we have the time to do things correctly and get them trained. So I just wanted you to know that. I want the rest of the council to know that we talked about it. So uh, that, that's, that's my comment to what's going on with this issue. Okay, anyone else? Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, um, Mr. James and I have uh, discussed this also because I've heard some of the, the same complaints. You know, if you hear it once, well, okay, somebody's griping. You hear it twice, you hear it three times, yeah, maybe there's something to it. Um, tell me something, uh, uh, third-party inspection services, are they cheaper than paying overtime? Well, I think I will say this, just I think I put it in the report. Our staff is already working overtime. Every one of our staff members works at least nine hours a day. They're coming in on Saturdays. They work through their lunch at times. Um, this week alone, I, almost everybody worked anywhere from, and maybe I'm not completely answering your question because I haven't evaluated that, but. So let me, let me maybe jump in, Councilman. I think one of the issues we're having, as Lisa and maybe I'll cut to the chase, is are working overtime. I think I have a concern with pushing our staff to work even more overtime than they are. Um, I think Lisa's point, maybe on the previous comment, is we are looking for the most efficient, cost-effective way to do it. So we balance overtime versus contract. So again, there's a decision to send them on the multi-inspections as opposed to the single off felt. Um, we are looking at where it would make more sense to hire staff going forward as opposed to contract or overtime that, um, you know, going forward. It probably on the overtime question depends on the inspection we're doing. It, it probably varies based on that. Uh, it's probably cheaper on an overtime to run them out to do a felt inspection, a single quickie. But if I've got a two-hour inspection of a commercial that needs plumbing and mechanical, it's probably cheaper to have um, the, the contract folks do it. Yeah, it, it is an interesting, uh, you know, dynamic there. Where do you where do you put your money? And I, I and I know you've thought about it. Like I said, I've I've uh, had this discussion. I've also read that Zucker report. They were not kind to Austin at all. No, they were. Um, <laughs> it was it, it really ripped them. And uh, when when I was comparing that report to even some of the worst complaints we've ever had here in the city. Uh, we're a shining example in, in, in comparison. So I think you are doing really good. Uh, something I, I, I do question though, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, contractors are well established in the city. They do a lot of work in the city. Uh, would it be possible um, to reward them for their good service? Yeah, I can understand if, a, if you're finding violation after violation after violation with the same uh, uh, contractors. But if there are no violations and you go out, uh, it, it's gonna require keeping an audit trail. But uh, is, is it possible to actually put some of these people on their, their, their they take them for their word that they know what they're doing? So, 
so I will say this, I'll go back to our core values is, you know, we treat everybody the way that we want to be treated. And to me, that's treating people equally. I understand what you're saying. And some of the things that we've talked about is maybe like taking photos, but, but we've had lots of conversations and we've come back to, there's nothing like going out. And I'm assuming you're talking about roof inspection. So, yes, okay. Mostly. Nothing like, you know, going out and physically seeing the work being done. Because somebody can take a picture and take a picture of the address and it can be the neighbor's house. And so. Yeah. So let me offer this up, <laughs> Councilman. I think, I think your point's well taken and in some regards it makes sense. And I would bet that, let me use the, let me use the example of, uh, of new home builders, maybe a, a little bit more applicable. And our, our inspectors are generally assigned to an area, so they work with the builder in the neighborhood. They probably over time come to understand the um, job superintendent and the level of quality of work that they do. So I would bet that they're thinking it through when they go out to a project with a super that's been there, that they've worked through the issues, that rarely has it, that has stable subs out there working, they probably do a quicker inspection than they would otherwise. One of the things I'll say though, and this is a, a bit of a bit of the issue. I think the companies that do construction struggle the same way we do with stable inspectors who know what they're doing. They struggle with crews the same way. And so you can have a fair amount of variability in those issues. Even among the firm that's generally very good, we'll see things that come up as issues uh, roll through. We'll see, you know, subs that they may have on that that have a problem. Um, just as they rush through. That applies to the work of uh, commercial, residential. I, I think, I will say this, the thing that's most, was most surprising to me when I sort of started in this field and remains today, and again, I, I dealt with it myself to this weekend with an AC repair issue and then my wife having to take off work to go back and go, hey, they didn't tape up the duct work, we got a problem, is, is how often there are issues that our inspectors catch. I think it would surprise most people that you expect to hire this firm, they're used to doing it, um, that there are issues, what I would say. But again, I think we are trying to do things to build relationships. So y'all meet how often with the contractor group? So we meet monthly with the contractor group. We meet uh, quarterly with uh, the Greater uh, San Antonio Area Builders Association. And then we actually um, have been meeting with each builder um, pretty regularly uh, to try to work through any issues that, that they have. And I will tell you, when it comes to uh, this, the uh, subs and the superintendents out there, there are many times that we go out there and if it's a minor issue, take care of it. We're not gonna charge a re-inspection. We'll come back next, the next time you call in for inspection, we'll check it then. So there's a lot of times that they're not charged a fee um, for things that are wrong where we're, if we were, you know, we could charge first as a reinspection fee for every time we go out. So we do make concessions when it comes to working with them and being flexible. I, I, I really do appreciate that. And, um, you know, if you, you can, you're pretty much justified 100% inspections. You know, if that's best practices, then let's continue to uh, go with our best practices. Um, I don't have any other questions. All right, anyone else? Dr. Kaiser? Just a quick question. Since there was a concern about um, waiting for some of the inspections on the re-roofing and that there could be damage while they're waiting, how long is it typically taking once, you know, a roofer, I guess, is put on all the felt to come and have someone inspect that? So if you call in your inspect, if you called in your inspection this morning by 6 a.m., you got an inspection today. Okay. Yes, so it's same day. So if they called it in yesterday after 6 a.m., you got your inspection sometime today. Okay. And, and like I said, we prioritize our homeowners who have to be at home, so typically that inspection could be any time during the day based on general geographic location. So, so I, I will say this too, a couple things that we have worked on a little bit and will continue to work on. One is, as we build those relationships and as folks know the time things take, they can preemptively call in now again, so if we've got a roofer who knows this is when I'm gonna start, this is when I'm in, they call in before six and go, I'm gonna be there today. 
this is one we can try to get out to get that that day. Again, we run the other extreme, which is they haven't done a quality control, and we literally go out to a series of homes and nothing's ready because the super's getting yelled at by his boss. Um, the other thing I'll say is, in, in today, for example, we did not conduct all the inspections that came in today. And part of that, and I'll give you an example, we did not conduct all the final roof inspections that came in today. We had, I think, 94 inspections called in today. Yes, 94 stops. And we rolled some of those that were not time sensitive. So if I don't have a homeowner who's saying, much like my wife was having to do today with the AC guy coming out, we will roll some. So when the roof is done, we'll roll it a day because it's not time sensitive like the felt inspection right. is. Because those that we know, and really we try to gauge it on, if they are waiting on us to move to the next step, we try to move more quickly as opposed to now, nah, if you get out, so, so to be clear, we at times have to roll and we did that today, but we didn't roll any felt. No, no, it was only roll. final, and roof. actually, that was the, I can't even remember the last time that we actually had a day where we had to do that. We actually had an inspector call in sick today, and so we were down a person. We have um, the two schools that are trying to open um, in August, so we had Rose Garden inspections and the new Comal school inspections, which are basically four hours, one direction, so our building official was at both spots, and so our plans examiner wasn't in the office all day today to do re review any plans because he was out helping with inspection so so yeah it's the first time and I can't even remember the last time that we actually had to say because these aren't you know necessary today that we can catch those tomorrow that we can move them tomorrow and we hope that we'll have a full staff tomorrow to be able to do that no I think that's a good turnaround time thank you mr. Larson well I just um, as we talk about this there's obviously a need but I will put a bug that perhaps we can discuss um, but one of the ways that we can increase capacity is potentially maybe decrease some of the regulations and inspections. And the reason I say that is if I'm an inspector working six days a week, nine hours a day, skipping lunch to check 100 things, I might be less effective than if I were checking 80 things in eight hours a day, five days a week. And so we may be actually losing quality by being too strict on quality. And I think that's something that we, we should genuinely... Uh, take time to to deeply evaluate and I will say councilman I think that's a that's a to be clear that is a valid point and and maybe the better example we have had is a bit with the planning and the zoning mm -hmm. side um, the more regulations we have the more time it takes for us to do that review and manage those things and again I think it's it's fair to say with each of those you need to look at how much value are we really adding by this regulation um, or not, and does it make sense to have a regulation on? I think that's a that's a fair point. I think we've hit that a little bit more on maybe our planning side to kind of go through some of those regs and decide if there's really merit to it. That and, and if and I'm also thinking at one point. I mean, if we want to control development to reduce some of these things, then we would have to make changes to our regulations to control how quickly we're growing as well. I'm not sure that's the direction council wants to take, but as you know, as an option. All right, anyone else? Mr. Crawford. Mr. James, don't we have, didn't we buy software that helps uh, get the inspection parts done by making them remote and they can do stuff out in the field and get it sent back to y'all so y'all know and they can move on to the next project without having to come back to the office and things like that? Isn't that a... Y yes, sir. One of the things that, again, y'all did is y'all made a significant investment in this software that really runs the entire gamut for the development process, so submittals, plan review inspections, and then tonight you approve $78,000 for the virtualization. That's a key element of that going forward. Um, and, and then, again, I know we're working on the tablet. Yeah, so so the, uh, the new software actually has a mobile um, module to it, and so um, just so y'all know, we actually are in data collection process now. We started last week, and we have we were having data collection this week as well to start working through all of our um, information, including our workflows. It's a you know it's going to be a couple month process, but we're in the process of that. It does include mobile inspections, so the inspectors. You know, one of the things I asked for in the budget is for us to have mounts in the vehicle so that truly their office is kind of in their vehicle. They were able to mount their tablets, which they already have, and to be able to use those from the field, they can 
they can, even if we don't have a connection, because we do have some very spotty areas of service in town, we can actually still go out, do the inspection, perform everything that we need to, which we can't do that now based on the resources that we have with our software, um, perform the inspection, and then it just, it holds in a holding pattern until we get that connection again and it downloads and it's real time. It'll be in the system, anybody can look at it. If you are the customer, you will know as soon as that inspection's performed if we have, you know, service at that time or within a short period of time. So yes. Anyone else? A couple quick comments. Inspections are a, pers are a public safety concern. I've lived in my house in shirts for more than 20 years. I've had a lot of repairs done. Um, I had a repair done recently where um, I had a plumbing problem in between my first and second floors. I had to rip out ceiling, get plumbing work fixed. Expensive. It's ugly. And why? The plumber told me that when the original work was done, the copper wasn't cleaned properly. I've had, I'm on my third air conditioning system. Second installation, the inspector came out and found some errors and made that contractor fix them. On my third water heater, last water heater I had installed, the inspector came out, saw something the contractor had done incorrectly, and made him correct it. Um, my point in these comments are around, it's also a matter of public protection. There are unscrupulous people out there that will do things inappropriately and take our money for it. And if we can offer expert help to help mitigate that risk, that is a core city service. I have to have my roof redone here soon. 77% loss from the hail. It's a mess. I'm having trouble getting somebody to address it. My insurance company sent me a check three weeks ago. I'm trying to find, get a contractor to get moving. I want my felt inspected. I want that thing inspected carefully because I have to live under it. I grew up in an area that pro, was prone to um, tornadoes, and you don't want a poorly installed roof. As to whether or not we use contractors, this is a variable demand work situation. It varies over time. A variable cost model using third party makes a lot of sense. If we overhire and we have a downturn like we had in 2009, who's going to pick who gets laid off? I don't want to carry those costs. As we said earlier, we don't have enough money to do all the things you want to do now. We have the permit fees help us respond appropriately to a variable amount of work in a variable cost model. It's financially smart, and it makes a lot of business sense. So that said, I'll stop. I wanted to say those things. I feel pretty strongly about this one. Um, there it is. So uh, is there a motion to approve Ordinance 18-T-22? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Dr. Scaglioli. Any other comments or questions from Council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Item number 11, resolution 18R75, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the city manager to enter into all necessary agreements to accept parkland and easements and granting an access and granting an access easement to provide for access to the city-owned parkland on the south side of Wiederstein Road to the west of FM3009, authorizing the city manager to act on behalf of the city in all matters related to the application and other matters in connection therewith. It's not as long as a bond caption, but the attorney must have made good money writing that one out. That's not. Um, so this, this is pretty straightforward. This is a little bit of a development issue and a parks issue um, in that we have a development occurring on this property. You may recall some of you have been on council a while. We came back in 2015 with this concept. We have a property that's generally at Wiederstein and FM 3009 uh, behind the car wash that's, that's closed down right there. Um, the property, while it's got frontage on 3009, does not have frontage on Wiederstein because of an existing city park. You're probably thinking to yourself, where is that city park? Have I ever visited it? 
You have not ever visited it because there's nothing there. It's just an overgrown little woodsy area. Um, it was a bit of a leftover piece, uh, something we've worked to make sure we don't take in the future. Um, but what we have here is a situation where the property owner is saying, hey, it would really benefit us if we could get access through the park property. Because it's a city park, though, we can't grant that easement or even sell the property. We couldn't sell the property unless there was a vote of the community, but we can't grant that unless we can find a public benefit. And so working with them, what we've come to is that they are going to dedicate, and it's commercial, so there normally isn't a parkland dedication requirement, but they're going to dedicate additional land. So again, I've got a small thing, but I've got a little bit more usable land as city park. We will grant an access easement through the park, generally as you've seen. They will then construct that access easement with their project. When they construct the parking associated, they will grant an easement so that 10 of those are available for use by the public. So the benefit is the development gets access off Wiederstein, which really helps with traffic flow, and the city gets a little bit more of a usable park with access for the public now to come and park to be able to use it. We're not gonna do a lot of improvements there. It's really going to be a trailhead. It's a place for folks who don't live on our current trail network to come park, some signage, be able to kind of get out of their car, probably a water fountain, et cetera, and then access the sidewalk, the hike and bike trail network, the sidewalk network to then use it and come back and get in their car. So if you don't live too close, you'll have a place to drive. So we need council's approval to accept the parkland to give us a little more usable. We need council's approval to accept the easement associated with the parking and then to authorize the grant for the access easement. As we work forward with the church, we'll pin things down. And so we didn't want to pin it down specifically as things may have to adjust or move slightly. And so we'll finalize those documents at such time as their plans are finalized. Uh, we, when we took it to council in 15, we took it to Parks Board. At that time, they were generally supportive of it, as was council. Took it back to Parks Board, and they said, yeah, great idea. Let's just start using a piece of land that right now we've got no use for. Seems like a win-win. So with that, we recommend approval. And again, the, the developer, owner, whatever your role in that would be is here as well for Revolution Church. All right, council, questions? Uh, yeah, I wish, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, Dr. Scaglione, okay. please. I wish, I wish they were all this simple. Uh, you brought it to us a, a couple of times, and, and we went over it. it sounded like a good uh, uh, plan then. Sounds like a good plan now. I'll make a motion that we approve resolution number 18R75. Second. second. Motion from Dr. Scagliola, a second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments or questions from council? I'm going to call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven eyes and no nays, the motion carries. And may we just real quick, we appreciate the efforts of the church. We think this is really a win-win where they're contributing to our community as well. So thank you to them. Very good. All right, next item on the agenda is a roll call vote confirmation. Mrs. Dennis. Consent agenda items one, two, four, five, six, and seven. A motion was made by Councilmember Edwards, seconded by Councilmember Gutierrez. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliello, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford. Voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed. Item number three, resolution 18R68. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Council Member Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliello, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford. Voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed. <clears throat> Item number eight, ordinance number 18M20. Motion was made by Council Member Edwards, seconded by Dr. Kaiser, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford voted yes. Council Member Gutierrez and Larson voted no. A motion passed. Item number nine, resolution number 18, R72. Motion was made by Council Member Edwards, seconded by Council Member Gutierrez, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford voted yes. Councilmember Larson voted no, motion passed. Item number 10, ordinance number 18T22 on first reading. Motion was made by Councilmember Edwards, seconded by Dr. Ka uh, seconded by Dr. Scagliola. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Councilmembers Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed. Number 11, resolution number 18R75. Motion was made by Dr. Scagliola, seconded by Councilmember Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Kaiser, Crawford voted yes. No one voted no. Motion passed. 
Thank you, ma'am. All right, the next item we have on the agenda this evening, we have a couple of workshops. The first one is discussion regarding goals and philosophy regarding use of our assets to include parks and recreation facilities and other amenities. Um, and so I'm going to uh, let Council Member Davis kick, us, Davis kick us off on this one. Um, Mr. Davis? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I, as, we, as we spoke before, when we had presentations on our fee schedule, um, Parks and Recreation is one of those ones where in some cases we have resident and non-resident rates and in other areas we, we do not. Uh, I asked for an update on this uh, and as part of that discussion I also, I also asked that, that at some point council needs to probably come up with a, a, a vision or a policy regarding what is our goal with, with Parks and Recreation as to in what scenarios do we want to underwrite a recreational activity uh, where we're operating an activity, when would it be acceptable to operate an activity at a loss where it's being underwritten by city tax dollars versus the policy should be that we operate a facility, whether it be something like a rec center or a pool or the civic center with the goal of at least breaking even uh, so that our user fees are designed to cover the cost of that operation or in what cases it's actually feasible to operate a facility or an activity where it actually generates a revenue uh, and brings in more money than it takes the cost to operate so that we could turn around and take those excess dollars and use them to fund other non-profitable activities. Okay. Um, I'll jump in as well. I, I think it's also important that the city council come together and, and come to a consensus on our policy. What, what, you know, what, why do we have uh, uh, the the senior center? I think the answers appear to be very easy, but, but what's our ultimate goal there? And we just had a discussion on whether or not we should fund and at what level um, our lunch program. Yeah, well, uh, maybe there's some question there because we haven't determined what's our goal there. What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, to Mr. Larson's point, is 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 it the role of government to, to do that or is it is it not? And, and I'm not sure that uh, we've given our, our, our team clear instruction about what we want to do with those assets, whether it's a pocket park, whether it's a large regional park, whether it's uh, a hike and bike trail system, whether it's uh, the pavilions in, in Pickerel Park, I mean, the, the library, you name it. What's What's our goal there? Are, are, we, are we looking to break even on, on providing those services? Are they appropriately uh, paid for with taxpayer dollars? Should we be looking to, to put a, uh, a program in place where we actually make money from the usage of the facilities? We need to answer those questions, probably broadly at first, and, and then have staff come back to us and say, well, based on your, your, your broad consensus, here's how we would implement some of those things. They're the experts. We are not. Um, or, or maybe the answer is simply from council, the status quo is good. We don't need to change anything or make further statement on, on what our goals are. I, I don't know. That's up to the city council. So uh, I think that's largely why we brought this up, why they put this on the agenda, and, and to get council to start a discussion, uh, probably not finish in a single evening, uh, but start a discussion on, on, on what do we want long term? What, what, what's the philosophy behind the the providing of service and of amenities that we do as a city. So that said, Mr. Edwards? I, and I think we can always get better um, and more efficient as well. So I, I do believe that having a discussion and at least coming to some type of workshop together and maybe having um, ha having a discussion not only just to include the, the parks and recs, but some, some of the um, some of the events that we have, um, like Church Fest, Jubilee, I mean, are we breaking even? Are we? Are they lost leaders? You know, so we have to think about those things as we go forward for our citizens because the last thing we want to do is go out and start increasing taxes or anything of that nature. So I agree with you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Mayor, we do, we do need to have this discussion. Anyone else? Thoughts? I... Perhaps, do you have a brief presentation for us as well? You know, staff tried to make an assumption of what council was interested in. We may have taken a bit of a different approach, I think. Um, so, so maybe let us, let us go through with a crack at it. I think, I think, and Lauren may just disagree with me on that one, the thought process, but I think what we really spent a lot of time on was
we want to be well positioned to respond to the philosophy that we set. And I think, I think the point's well taken. There isn't an unlimited, unlimited supply of money. If you look across the board, parks traditionally, they do things as a bit of a, a, a randomness. So the parks we have out there, they're open, they're free to the public, nobody pays anything for it. Uh, if you want to get into the pool, an outdoor pool, most communities charge a nominal amount. Some communities probably have taken a bit of the bolder step and said, it's more cost to actually track that nominal amount of revenue than it's really worth. We're not gonna charge in that nominal emission because it's, it's costing too much. And then I think what we've seen, and in particular we'll touch on this a little bit with some of our partnerships is, you know, those models have changed. So for example, we've talked a lot about BVYA and we heard about the work of Johnny McDowell a lot at the last meeting. BVYA, Buffalo Valley Youth Association, which operates sort of our baseball fields, if you will. Um, they operate on the older model, which is if you sign your kid up to play, let me know when you're going to work the concession, let me know when you're going to be out to mow, and this is when you're going to help do that stuff. So it's the parents who are out there doing those sort of activities. SISA, San Antonio Youth Soccer Association, um, who manages our soccer fields, has gone the, the new model, which is essentially what you pay to sign your kid up to play covers the cost of hiring a contractor to mow the fields and they hire a concessionaire who, who they have a contract either revenue sharing with or for a price they pay to do it, which is sort of the new model. Um, there, there's not sort of a right or wrong in theory the BBYA model, you can have your child pay f play for less because we're not paying for that work if you're willing to put that effort in. And so I think from a staff perspective, as we look at what do we want the users to subsidize, which is a legitimate model, you know, let's have the folks who use the facility or use the activity pay for it versus the community as a whole, or we split the difference some year. We've talked a lot about that philosophy, and again, heard it tonight with the Senior Center that again, I think is a valid conversation of what are we charging our residents who are paying taxes to support the capital and support the operation versus folks from other communities to contribute? Do we have enough of a differential there? Um, and, and where do we sort of make trade-offs for those? And I think each facility is different. So I think staff, has thought a lot about that and, and what the focus of this presentation in large part is going to be is we feel like at this point we're limited in our capacity to respond quickly so that if council said on this type of facility let's have this philosophy that staff can say we can make that change and we can get up and running quickly. And so a lot of what you'll hear tonight is about how we want to position ourselves so that if we look at a particular facility and we say, look, level of service is here, accessibility and cost for our residents is a higher priority or whatnot, can we respond to be able to do that? Because to be blunt, we often don't have a lot of choices. When we built the recreation center, as I recall, or the story I've heard is, we didn't have necessarily a lot of takers jumping on board to say, hey, let's operate the facility. When we had the senior center and went back out for the request for qualifications or proposal, we, I think, maybe had one entity come back. And it's legitimate for council to say, if I don't have a lot of folks coming in who, who are offering to operate it with different models, then to achieve our primary goals, we may need to take this on in-house at a time, or we want that leverage, that bargaining power with multiple people to be able to achieve that. I think that is a legitimate thing. And so a lot of what you're gonna hear about tonight is what really is a key is us queuing ourselves up. So if council says on this facility, this model, we can say we can respond in a timely manner. We've looked at what's really involved in that and have some good semblance of numbers and can follow that direction going forward. So maybe see this as a segue to that future discussion, understanding the areas we can step in. And I think that's consistent with a little bit what we've tried to do. There's been a big push to get into recreation. If any of you said, hey, I wanna join a softball team, is there really that ability on our, on our community or an adult, I don't know, boxing club? Maybe helpful at times, we don't have that. 
but we can start with things like kickball. It's a fairly easy, low-cost sport to get into. It tends to be taken a little bit more relaxed kind of attitude toward it as opposed to something more competitive. And by that, we build up capacity. We get some revenue. We get some experience. We buy that software program that lets us schedule events and teams, and we're able to do that going forward. So with that, let me long kick off and just sort of run through the direction we thought, and then we can get feedback on where we go. Yeah, so I just have some, some a higher level um, information here. So basically, you know, how, how are we how are we operating right now? How are we providing parks and recreation to the community? And you saw it earlier when all the different groups came up and represented their organization. You know, we have all these different agreements with uh, nonprofits, uh, the BVYA, uh, the SISA, uh, YMCA, or the Aquatic Center, um, and you know, we have different agreements, different terms, um, and all that information is there. And then we also uh, provide other recreation opportunities in our community center through private groups. Sorry, I'm not close enough. <laughs> There's a gap here. <laughs> I'll lean forward. Um, so uh, we provide uh, private groups rent their community center through uh, short-term agreements or for like a year to do twirling, Zumba, line dancing, things like that. And we're just now beginning to explore opportunities with other private um, commercial groups to provide, um, for instance, yoga in the park. Like we had International Yoga Day uh, last Thursday. We had 100 people out at Pickle doing yoga. Yeah. So obviously we hit the mark and we need to continue to, you know, work on that trend and, and provide some sort of opportunity, whether it's a free yoga event or whether it's paid courses uh, that are fee-based. And so we're exploring those relationships where before we didn't have the opportunity to do that. So as you talked about, our goals basically so far, um, you know, have been let's subsidize a portion of the cost for the recreation opportunities that we provide through these facilities um, with that goal of broad utilization by church residents, but also the surrounding communities. We've talked about that. You know, Marion doesn't have a baseball program. They can come over here and play baseball. Um, Selma doesn't have a lot as well. You know, the kids from Selma can join in in our sports. Um, so these agreements do allow for use of the facilities by like more competitive sports programs, the club teams and things like that. But the overarching goal has still been to focus on youth recreation and sports skill development. Uh, we've also been relying very heavily on outside groups, particularly nonprofits, uh, to operate these facilities. And the city has been focusing on park maintenance. Uh, with that being said, we have not heavily invested um, in capital costs, which has led to a decline in our older facilities. And that's what we're working on right now. Uh, park staff has really been focusing on improving efficiencies, increasing our staffing levels, increasing our maintenance budget, uh, to try to start catching up. I use the term autopilot. There's a lot of things that should be occurring that are on autopilot, and we're just not there yet. We're tightening internal controls, developing policies, uh, maintenance schedules. Um, and if we can get to that autopilot mode, that will free up time for us to invest in exploring some of these other opportunities. Um, what we have been able to do um, is, is focus on outdoor rec opportunities because the indoor recreation has been covered and the little league and associations have covered the operation of those leagues. So we can focus on that gap in programming, which is uh, music movies in the park, uh, the star parties, the nature discovery series, again, all through partnerships and sponsorships so that all of this is covered at essentially no cost um, aside from staff time involvement. We're also looking at the recreation needs for adults, like Mr. James mentioned. Some of the simple things we can do, utilize facilities we already have, not intensive in terms of staff time. And so adding those things like dodgeball and kickball, we've been exploring symphony in the park, date nights, things like that for adults to enjoy. Um, and then we're looking at indoor rec opportunities where there is a service gap. So one of the big ones is teen programming. We've been playing with the idea of teen nights at the North Center or at the community center, more open gym time in the community center because it does have basketball goals and we have a big basketball crowd in the city, uh, art classes, things like that. So um, comparisons, when we, we had a lot of talk about, uh, you know, could we do some of this stuff in house? And so we started looking at a high level uh, as to what it would take to take over some of these operations. Um, two key components are gonna be the operating costs and the challenges that are gonna be associated with ramping up staff. So for reference, some of the numbers, um, 
from DOSREC, the new facility that New Braunfels is building. Um, they have a 1.48 million staffing budget, nine full-time employees, and 225 seasonal or part-time positions just for that facility, not in addition to their park maintenance staff, their other recreation uh, facilities. Um, our partner, the Y, here at Shirts, has a 1.55 million staffing budget, and they have 220 staff members at the facility currently. For reference, Shirts right now as a city has 407 budgeted positions with about 373 filled currently. So that would obviously be a big increase in our staff citywide. So that's something to consider. And then the operating costs. You know, the YMCA right now has 3.2 million operating costs, and New Braunfels Dosserac has about 2 million in operating costs. I'm going to pause for some questions there, Warren, I think. There's questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I just, I'm, I'm just. 220 staff members just for the shirts facility? That's correct. Can you dive a little bit deeper on that? Because that's, that's pretty incredible. There's 60 lifeguards alone to manage the aquatic center and the outdoor pools. Um, so there's seasonal employees in that number. It's not full-time staff. But and they have a lot of part-time fitness instructors and all the things that are offered there. Those, uh, that, that is included in that staff count. We would appreciate the comments and questions. I mean, part of this Please for us, and I mean this sincerely, is really for us to sort of understand all those issues so we can go back and dig and respond. Okay. So um, we wanted to dive into a little bit more about, you know, the YMCA and our relationship with the Y and what are other cities doing? Are we the only ones in this kind of relationship? And the answer is no. Um, obviously, there's several in the area. So the city of Cibolo, you're aware of that project. Um, and the relationship there, you know, it's similar. The city has the land and, and has the bond uh, to build the facility. The YMCA also pitched in funding to construct the building. Um, and they'll have the same fee structure as shirts, um, as do all the other YMCAs now um, in the region. Uh, city of Bernie, um, they have a building that they already owned. And they leased the building with the YMCA and they in turn invested money into renovations and that's how the city of Bernie now provides indoor recreation. Um, the city of San Antonio has numerous different arrangements with the YMCA. Um, some are city owned property and then the Y contributed funds for construction. Some the Y owns the building outright and the city owns the property. Um, and then in the case of the walls and YMCA, the city actually pays the Y about two million to operate that facility in a privately owned uh, commercial development strip center to fill a service gap um, because they didn't have any recreation in that area. So those are kind of what's going on in the other <coughs> YMCA partnerships around us. And then I started looking at other cities that I'm familiar with and then know some folks that work in those departments and that you know are sort of our benchmark cities and closer to population. And the membership, you know, some of those comments came up the cost of our membership and is it a good value, is it too expensive, um, and obviously our goal is to provide the best value for the least amount of funds, So, um, but I did some high level research and they're all over the map as to how much they cost, what they provide, and um, we'd have to get a lot more in depth as to what it actually covers. Some basically get you just into the fitness room, some get you free childcare, some get you a pool, some don't, um, so there's a lot of variation here. And then I looked at Leander, which is actually the closest to us in population, because I found out that they just uh, passed a bond to build a new recreation center. And I thought it was going to be city run, and they just approved in May to contract with the Y to run their operation as well. So I don't know anybody in Leander, but I'm going to call them, because I assume it's probably the similar situation that we're in. They just didn't have the capacity to run that uh, in the, and ramp up staffing to the level that they needed to to get that completed in time. Um, so basically, you know, we talked about this and our recommendations, you know, we'd love to see how New Braunfels does. That's our neighbor. And um, they opened July 21st and they have um, paid quite a bit of money for a feasibility study and that's how they set their rates. Um, and they think they're going to be able to hit their budget and um, they do have an 85% cost recovery mandate. And some cities do have that in place. And that would be one of the philosophy discussions that we'd want to have. Again, what 
what do we want to operate at what level. Um, they also have to um, fundraise now for scholarships. Um, they're doing a big gala to fundraise some money to be able to provide for those who can't afford the membership rights. Um, and that's one of the things that the YMCA actually can do really well, being a nonprofit. Um, and they um, do give out 200,000 in uh, scholarships to our community right here in Church to Blow. Um, we want to see how we fare in this year's budget process. You know, how, how are we going to continue to keep up with the park renovations and see what else we can do to help get, like I said, on that autopilot mode. Uh, we want to focus on better positioning ourselves to maybe add new facilities in the future. Um, these facilities do have lifespans. Um, the most uh, recent one that's going to come up is the outdoor pools. They're both built in 1976, um, aging very quickly. Um, and so, you know, 10 years down the road, we're going to need to discuss, well, before that, we're going to need to discuss outdoor pools uh, because that's going to be the next thing that's going to need to be addressed. Uh, the new buildings we've built, the Netatorium, the Rec Center, they've got a lot more life in them. Um, and if we do decide to take over operations in the future, we decide we want to do something in-house, you know, we do need to look at feasibility studies and sort of an implementation process. Maybe we phase some things in, some different facilities in, instead of doing it all at once. So we want to be able to plan and prepare. And that's just why we wanted to have this discussion, so we would know which direction we should focus on. That's all I have for now. Any other questions? Mr. Davis? Yeah, I've, I've got a few comments. Um, I agree that I think we need to do some feasibility studies and we need to look at some long-range planning. I, I, I don't know if I necessarily buy into a three to five year implementation process because I don't think we know what that answer is. It might be longer. I mean, to be honest, it might be longer. It might be we could do it next year, depending on which particular aspect we're talking about and what level of service we want to provide. Could you go back a few? Sure. Um, go back another one. Stop there. Um, and this is why I think I, I would like, I would encourage the staff to, or I would make a recommendation that, that I think council should encourage the staff or request the staff to look at these individual programs. And again, I'm not an advocate for doing anything in-house or contracting it out. What, I, what I'm an advocate for is doing what's best for the residents at the best cost of the residents. And if that means contracting it out, then it, so be it, contract it out. For example, we contract out the senior center operations. We contract out the YMCA or the rec center operations to the YMCA. We contract out the pool operations. We don't contract out the civic center. But I can certainly make an argument that maybe financially it would be better for us to contract out the civic center operations as far as that's the I mean, So I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's one of those things where where the staff should be looking at these things and have those questions. Now, you brought up a good point that you said we talked about the rec center and we had one, one taker. Um, I'm not necessarily a, a big fan of sole source one taker to do a contract because you're, it's take it or leave it, really. Uh, and the question is, well, what, what would it take for us to do it in-house? I think the numbers here are a little bit misleading. Um, where we say, you know, you've got a 1.5 million in staffing, we've got 3.2 million in operating costs, but we don't talk about what the city funds into the YMCA to augment the membership rates. We don't talk about how much money they're actually getting in from the membership rates from all the people that use it. Uh, you've got a number of 220 staff members, but again, that needs to be qualified because a large chunk of those are part-time or seasonal employees, which again, if the city were doing that, there's a different financial impact on that based on, on what benefits they do or they do not get. Uh, and again, you're, we're looking at numbers that the YMCA has determined what is best for them. You know, you mentioned 60, 60 lifeguards. Well, do they need 60 lifeguards? Maybe they do, maybe they need 70, I don't know. Uh, so like I said, I, I would encourage the the way forward should be, I think the staff should look at those particular programs. And again, another point, BVYA. You mentioned the model that, that BVY has. Well, what happens when the volunteers don't step up anymore? 
uh, are, is the standard in our, in our city going to be that we'll accept the ball fields not getting mowed? Or are we going to step in and we're going to pick that up uh, to assist BVYA? Or what happens when BVYA just says, and I understand they've been here for 44 years, and I hope they're here for another 44 years, but what happens when BVYA says, we're done? Do we stop all of our, and that's a significant portion of our youth rec programs. So I would encourage that our way forward ought to be having the staff look at those individual programs, the, the youth sports, and I understand your, the path that we're on with filling in the gaps that don't exist now, and I think that's a great thing to do with movies in the park, the concerts in the park, and everything else. But I, I would encourage that, that the staff look at the alternative scenarios, that we look at BVYA and just play the what if. Mm -hmm. If we had to take it over, here's what it would take. And that's going to tell us whether it's a one-year, three-year, five-year, ten-year program, or whether we're going to be in for a rude awakening. And the same thing with all of our other activities, the outdoor pools, um, uh, the rec centers, the civic centers, the community centers, all that stuff. And, and so that we have, we have something on council that we can discuss on what's, what's the right balance going forward. So if I may, Councilman, and, and I appreciate that, that, that's really helpful. Would you be okay if we sort of went maybe one or two of those, call it programs at a time? I think that'd be a little bit easier for staff to manage maybe to focus the discussion and again we, we can certainly come back with council you know my initial reaction maybe is look at um sisa first because it's just soccer whereas bbya is multiple sports so i think that'd be a test case and then maybe the outdoor pools as yeah. well because that's really just a contract for them to provide lifeguards and operate so it's a little more focused and I think that would help us when we get to the rec center and natatorium so maybe we tackle those two yeah I'd, I'd be fine with I, I think it's something we just need to step through and, and I and I'm, like you said let, let's give us an honest look you know I as far as I understand you know outdoor pools are an expense um, and like you said is it even worth the time or the effort to turn around and charge admission and collect the fees and I mean Maybe the right answer is, for as long as it's open in the summer, we just obligate that money and we operate the pools and people have a nice place if they don't have a, a pool um, where they can go and use, use a, a swimming facility. I don't know. But I'd like, I'd like to see the numbers. I'd like to see some different proposals. Okay. I'm, I'm reticent to comment, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, we have a Parks and Recreation Board too. Maybe they should take first pass at these things. They are uh, citizens that have volunteered to serve. They've got uh, um, the unique position in the city of that's what they look at, Parks and Recreation. And they're representative of, of the citizenry. I, I would suggest perhaps staff work with park, the Parks and Recreation Board and then that collaborative effort come forth with some commentary back to council. Um, just as we do with other boards, committees and commissions where we have folks that have stepped forward be, and, and in many cases and probably most cases have volunteered to do work because that's what they're most interested in. Um, so I see M Mr. Davis nodding his head so if, if, it, if, it's, if there's no objection from council then I, I think I'd love to hear uh, from the the point of view and expertise of our volunteers on the Parks and Recreation Board. We can do that. All right. Anything else on this one? All right. Thank you very much. Oh, Mr. Larson. Well, one thing I'd like to interject in there is I think it's a great opportunity um, to measuring demand is is to test the market. I think there's something to be said for if we put a request for proposal to run an adult recreation league and one dinky person applies for the opportunity that that might say that there's people who are evaluating the market in shirts and make making a determination that it's just not quite there yet or maybe we get 15 people and we say okay that doesn't mean we have to go through the private sector to make it happen but we've tested the waters and we say well maybe there's something something that we have here i know every community is different every city is different i visited the, the out what used to be the alamo heights pool um 
I almost couldn't even fit in the pool, not because I'm fat, but because there's so many people there. And it's, it was almost in disrepair as the city was running it or the community was running it. They, they gave it to a private company who put a grill in there. They serve adult beverages. They, um, they've made some improvements. And I mean, it's just it's a packed house. And so I don't think that it's always the solution when it comes to parks and recreation, but it certainly is a great tool to measure community demand. And I'd like to make sure that we include those options as we, as we look for what's best for shirts. All right. Very good. I think that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next item, we have uh, another workshop, discussion and possible action regarding the makeup of the interview committee for the boards, commissions, and committees. Uh, Mr. Larson, you asked for this one. I'll let you kick that one off. Yes, I, and I don't think it should take long, but um, just to clarify, I think everybody who serves on the interview committee is absolutely qualified to do so. And I think council should certainly have the final determination on who gets appointed to boards and commissions. Um, I have no objection to that. I just think that I, I'd like to discuss whether or not we should reconsider the makeup of that in terms of how many council members are part of that board. Um, I think council making the final decision means it'd make more sense in my mind to have an advisory board that gives us a different perspective, uh, maybe include more people from boards and commissions, um, maybe one council liaison. Uh, as of right now, it's, it, my understanding is that it's pretty heavily, heavily populated with council members. And in my view, what's the purpose of council giving recommendations to council um, when we can hear directly from the boards and commissions themselves? All right, Mrs. Dennis. That being said, uh, you know, uh, we can do, uh, I, we can set up whatever you want. It's, it, it, I'm, I, you know, work for you guys. If you want me to go and talk to possibly all the chairs of the different uh, boards, and maybe see if that would be a good committee. We can we can bring that back. You, like you said, a council member Larson, you are ultimately y'all are going to be the ones that are going to be making you know the ultimate decision of the appointments. We can set this up however you wish. I just provided you some history of what ha you know you know what, what what was going on you know ten years you know earlier. If, if you guys discuss it, and you tell me what you would like to do. I can set up the interview board and we can we can pass like um, I kind of provided just a, a, an example but you know we can change this up any way the council wants to do it you tell me and uh, y'all just tell me what you would like to do very good thoughts yeah. mr. Edwards typically after every election we um, we go through and we volunteer and we people say well I'll take this committee I'll take that committee these, are, these opportunities were available at that time. That is correct. Um, however, um, we were having an issue with trying to get them filled. So, um, and maybe not having an issue with them tr with trying to get them filled, but I can certainly say the people, the, um, we did a lot of shuffling, and, um, and, and there are some that have more than others on here. Um, however, the reason why this council has done that, because in the past, We've asked who wants to serve on what committees, and we've given leeway and said, okay, go for it. Um, you have to volunteer for it. So I don't know if there's a, a difference in, in what we're doing now versus um, what we're entertaining doing in the future, or even um, if there's a change even necessary. Mr. Larson? Yes, Mr. Edwards, just to clarify, I'm not requesting that we review the makeup of the board by reappointing different council members to the board, um, but rather that we review whether or not the interview board should be housed by four council members, but instead replacing, removing council members um, and replacing them with, with members of boards and commissions who will be working with the uh, individuals we appoint so that the makeup is maybe one council liaison and then the rest uh, volunteer community members instead of four council members. I hope that clarifies what I'm looking to discuss. Yeah, I, um, I, I thank you for the clarification. Um, also, when we're looking at this, um, I think in the past that we've always had an opportunity to, to, to speak out or to speak up on um, the different committees that we've wanted to be on. 
Um, I don't think there's an issue with that part of it, but maybe your point, it would be at the will of the council to whatever the council wants to do. I will clarify that the board, uh, the committee right now, you know, has three council members and then one alternate. That way, if one of you three that wanted to be on there is unavailable, then we would pull in that alternate. Mr. Davis? Yeah, I just want to say, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there is a right way or a wrong way to do this. I, I, in reading the packet, and I, when I first got involved in the boards and commissions, it was simply the mayor and two council members. I remember that, that day vividly. Um, I think we've made some good changes. We've got three council members, and we've got members of some of the key boards that are on there. Um, I, I, I would like to say for the record that for all of the ones that we've been to, uh, we've always had at least three council members there, and we've had other board members not show up. So to me, one concern would be if we reduce the number of council members that are there, and again, and historically, it used to be the mayor and two council members alone. If we reduce the number of council members that are there and increase the number of board members in there, <clears throat> I, I would hope that they would all show up to conduct the interviews when we have them. And then the other part that you know a lot of people aren't aware of is when we get volunteers for these boards, we get some people in there that there, there's some really odd decisions that have to be made. When I say odd decisions, we get some people that are on, on, on a volunteer for a board and they may only want to be on planning and zoning. And when we interview them and talk to them, it's all they want to do is planning and zoning. And we may have three people that just want to be on planning and zoning when there's only one opening. Or, or during that particular, particular time, there may not be any openings on planning and zoning. Um, and then we've got folks in there that will list every board and a commission because they just want to serve the community. So one of the things that we get involved in on the council level is trying to sort through the request from the residents of what they want to do, whether it's narrow or broad, and, based, and, and look at that based on the openings that we have. So in some cases, it's we've got three openings on TSAC. Nobody wants to be on TSAC. So we actually engage with these folks to see if how deep their interest is in other boards and commissions mm -hmm. uh, and, and what their, their goals are with regards to serving in the community. Um, to be honest with you, I, I'm not, not to discount any of our other board members, but you know, we don't, as a council member, I don't have a dog in the hunt. I don't, I, you know, I don't try to push somebody onto a board that they don't want to be on. Um, but at the same token, we're trying to balance out keeping these boards active because they all have different quorum requirements and they all have different uh, requirements for their meetings. So a lot of the times it's spent just talking to the person, trying to figure out what they want to do. And I'm not quite sure that, that you might get that same level, that same viewpoint, if all of the interview people are just people on boards. You know, they may be looking at it, well, I'm looking at all these people. I really want Joey or Sally on my board. Um, I would hope that that wouldn't happen. But I mean, to me, that is a potential. So I mean, to me right now, I, it's, I, I think we have a pretty good, pretty good uh, Set. I, I really wouldn't mind seeing some other board members on there. We've got uh, we've got uh, two from EDC. We've got one from. We had one from Planning and Zoning. I, I did. Excuse me to interject. I did talk to uh, the chair of the Planning and Zoning, Michael Dalla. He said, you know, he would be more than happy to serve on this. And you know, we had Dave Richmond because he had been in the community for years and years and years. He was a very good person. To, you know, like you said. You know, to sit down and talk to these people, you know, if, you know, they want to be on uh, planning zoning, and that's all they want to be. But after interviewing with them and taking that time with them, you know, because we don't want to lose interest in these volunteers. We want to try to, to talk to them, and that's what this board does. Talk to them and see if there's other interests that maybe they can serve on a board, you know, that, that does have an opening, and then they could be reconsidered, you know, later on for the one that they want. We've seen that a lot. Um, there was a time that there was no volunteers 
Okay, so we're now we're spe uh, uh, peaking some interest. You know, the interview board is going to be meeting again because we still have a couple of vacancies, and I've got some new av applications in. So, you know, like I said, you guys tell me what you want, but I will. I wanted to interject and let you know that Michael Dahl said that he would be more than happy. You know, to to, to fill that role that was vacant from Dave Richmond. I, again, I, I kind of see the value of having three council members on there. Uh, we look at it from a broad, at least I do, I look at it from a broad perspective. Uh, I wouldn't mind codifying and formalizing the other members. I, I think we should go beyond council. Uh, I, we ought to codify and, and, and figure out which specific board members are part of that interview committee, not pick a ad hoc, but specifically pick a chairman of whichever boards, EDC, planning and zoning, maybe even parks and recs. You know, if we can, if we can maybe expand that to four and then have a seven person interview committee, I'd, I'd be okay with that. Just a thought. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, I remember uh, uh, before uh, the mayor sat down with two council members to give the interviews, it was just Oh, you want to serve? Oh, okay, we'll consider that. There was no formal process. I like the way the process works now. Uh, and we, as leaders of the community, it's our responsibility to appoint members to the boards and commissions. That's our responsibility. That's what we do. Um, can't have four people there. That would establish quorum. So three is an appropriate number. Uh, as a as far as having uh, other committee members there, I'm all for that idea. There's a lot of things about EDC that I don't understand. Uh, I, a lot of things about B&Z that I don't understand. I don't know the, the type of qual uh, qualifications that a person really needs to embrace in order to be on those boards or commissions. So I, I appreciate the insight from the uh, maybe the chairman of the board or uh, some designee. So as, as far as the makeup of the uh, interview committee, I like the way it, it, it is right now. Yes, like uh, Councilmember Davis said, uh, maybe expand it a little bit more. And you uh, want me to include um, your wishes that you would want me to also include the chair of planning zoning, Michael Dahl. Oh, definitely. Okay, very good. Yeah, I, I, I was really surprised that, that he wasn't part of the, the committee to begin with. So uh, I, I think that'd be a, a good first step. But, you know, you do an exceptional job coordinating all these activities. So uh, yeah, we can sit up here and make recommendations, but I wanna know what works for you. You know, so you're empowered a lot of times to make these kind of decisions. Let us know what you need. That's a question to me, I'll tell you. I, I like the way the committee is made up. I do like the idea of including the chair, planning and zoning, because you know, there are some of you that you know, are not f that familiar, and I think that his insight would, be, would, would, would act, help, because you know, there's a lot of people, they want planning and zoning, but then when you, know, you sit down and you talk to them, you find out, oh my gosh, no, you're really, what you're trying to tell us, you know, is I understand you want planning and zoning, but it, we found it with a fit on another board. I like the way the makeup is. If you would like me to, you know, add another member, I mean, I, I, I can do whatever you guys wish. You tell me, it's gonna, I mean, I'll coordinate with, you know, that my job is to coordinate this with that committee, you know, give them options and choices when you're available you know, so that we can do interviews because we got some that we need to do right now, you know, so that I can, you know, coordinate with them a good time that's, that they can, and then, you know, coordinate with that, with the people that want to, want to because, you know, it's a, it's a two-way process. The interview committee, are you available, and are the interviewees are available? So it's a lot of work back and forth, but, you know, it works for me. I like the way it works. I, you know, you just tell me what you want. We can formalize it like this, you know, as, as, as a draft example. You tell me. Question. Question. Oh, hold on. Okay, Mr. Gutierrez. 
the interview committee consists of how many members? Right now, it consists of three council members, one alternate council member, and um, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Chair uh, Tim Brown, uh, Judge Richards, and there's another one. Forgot. I guess that's it. One, two. Yes, we we had not replaced the planning and zoning. It's six six members. Yes. Yeah. Ultimately. It should be six with one alternate or I mean you know it's a lot of people I mean I know that when somebody comes in to interview and you see all these people it's like whoa so you know you want to grow it that's fine but you know realize that you know these people are coming in um, and I remember interviewing with the council you know and at this table of all these people and you know kind of being overwhelmed with all these people so think about that a little bit but I'm, I'm going to be quiet right now. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Crawford? Mr. Gutierrez, on the three council members, the alternate doesn't show up unless one of the council members is going to be absent. So that's not a fourth member to be considered about in most cases. That's and correct. We have three, but one council member is an alternate. If you read, that's what we've got. We've got the three members are... Davis, Edwards, and Crawford. Now, if one of you three are absent, then I would, excuse me, then I would call in the alternate, which is Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola. And that's what happened last time because one of the council members was out of town. So well, the alternate is not the alternate if he's called. He is the primary. Yes. He's a voting member at that point. He's a voting yes. member. I just, and I think okay uh, well, point of order uh, during the Dr. Scandiola during during the interviews we do not vote that is correct it's recommendations only there's no voting that is correct and so that would be a point of information not a point of order but 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 no problem I think we accommodated uh, Mr. Crawford it's still yours I, I just made the wrong comment I said a voting members he's a member of the board at that point so okay. Thank you. Anyone else? So um, I'm curious, is anybody taking a look at how other cities do this? Oh, I did, I did put some information oh, in. I, I'm asking these folks. You're good. I know you did. I thought, uh, Mayor, if you will, I thought it was interesting that the uh, city of Cibolo actually has their uh, candidates come before the, and, and you, you know, you talk about shell shock. Uh, sort of like when you stepped in uh, for your interview and you saw uh, this, the six of us. Uh, can you imagine? having an interview in front of uh, an open crowd like that. Um. As a matter of fact, I did do that because uh, I did interview with the city of Cibolo because I am a city of Cibolo resident. Mm -hmm. And I did interview for the uh, Charter Review Commission. And it, yes, did it just like this. They asked me yeah. questions back and forth. Indeed. Thanks. So so I did a little looking, at least a couple of cities. and here, in some cities, it's, it's like what we're describing. You have some permanent members of a single interview committee made up of, of, of council members only, made up of a blend of council members and other board members. Sometimes just the boards do their own interviewing, and there's a final vetting process with council. Um, in some cities there's, uh, that have districts or named places, um, committee members, board committee committee members are appointed by individuals. So place one would appoint a place one person, and place two would appoint a place two person, um, and, and the like. Uh, in some other ones, uh, where, where there's a blend, right, where there are certain uh, boards, committees, and commissions that uh, uh, report to a committee of council, that is to say, if there is a planning and zoning committee of council, then the planning and zoning commissioners are appointed by the full council, but on recommendations made by that particular committee. There's myriad ways to do this. I think the wisdom in, that I was able to gather in looking at the different ways that different cities do this uh, is that at some level there, there, there is variability in who makes appointments. It's not always the same folks. Now that makes for more work, and it can be a bit more challenging. 
So I guess what I would say to the council at this point is, think about this one a little. Think about what might work for us today and what might be more germane for 70,000 people or 80,000 people. You know, maybe it makes sense that for planning and zoning, there's seven members of council, there's seven members on that board, correct? The commissioners, or is there nine? Nine commissioners? Seven. Seven. There's seven members of council, seven members of that. Maybe that's the way that we do it. Maybe each individual council member makes an appointment. Think about the different ways that we could go about it. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, there was a time where we simply didn't have enough volunteers. And it was merely a formality and a thank you for stepping forth because now we can have a quorum. I don't think we're there anymore. I don't think that we'll be there in the future as we grow. Um, I think a varied approach might work. I think that having no one on an interview committee from a board or committee or commission but other folks that aren't involved in that particular role making a decision about who they're going to send to that group, I struggle with. I would, I would rather have a minority of council members and a, and, and a majority of planning and zoning members interview who their colleague is going to be. Just to just, I, I, they're going to have to work with them. And, and they're going to be able to answer questions more effectively than we who have maybe never served on one of those boards, committees, or commissions. So rather than make a decision about what we might do differently this evening, I'd, I'd, I'd ask everybody to think about that. Think about how we might structure. Um, think about what, what the most sustainable model is as we grow. Because even though we've done things to try to slow our residential growth, we're not getting under 4% a year. Any other thoughts? Mr. Edwards? I don't think we've had a problem with the, the council members being there um, in the past. We've only had a problem with the actual committee members being there. So, so that's where we've been getting our absenteeism typically. Yeah, and this was, this was the first time that, that there was um, one of the oh, members, wow. Roy Richards, was not available. He's always there. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to bring that up. He's too. always there. Mr. Crawford? I like what you said about having P and Z members come along with the three council members and work. If it was EDC, we'd have three EDC members maybe or some, whatever the number is. But that does give a lot of experience for that particular subject. That might make the board a little bit more difficult because we normally do three or four different committees at a time. So but that concept of having somebody from every board might be, might be a good thing to think about. Is it um, in your thought process, Mr. Mayor? Would you want to bring this back in a couple of weeks or a month or so or what or ask Mr. Larson or Mr. Davis or other members what they think? Since we want it, since you want us to think about it, just give us a time frame, please, sir. Yeah, so I um, we don't have a meeting for two weeks and so I'm fine two weeks, three weeks out. It, 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 it Leave it to staff. flexible. Um, but I'll 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 put it on the agenda for us. So in the interim I I will like to I would like to you know, conduct interviews after the 12th of July because we do have some more vacancies and we've gotten some good applications in. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and call in Michael Dalla mm -hmm. you know, to, to sit. And then once we decide, you tell me, we'll put this on. You, you let me know when we need to put this back on. Council, any objection to that makeup, the current committee? Status quo is fine for a little while. I just think that down the road as we as we grow that, that we're we have a different set of needs and we should respond to that with the way that we have this set up um, maybe you get better participation if it's not always the same folks and it's only once a quarter or once every half um, that individuals have to serve because their particular board committee or commission <coughs> hasn't had a need and that rotation may take some of the burden off uh, the folks that have to be there every single time. But something to think about. All right. That said, if there's nothing else on that item, then we do have a need for closed sessions. Uh, we have two this evening. One, 
Uh, City Council meet in closed session under Section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code Personnel Matters to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of the City Manager. And secondly, City Council meet in closed session under Section 551.087 of the Texas Government Code Deliberation Regarding Economic Development and Negotiations, in particular Project E-041, E-043, and E-044. We're going to take these in reverse order. We're going to start with economic development and then um, go to 551.074 with regard to the city manager. This time we will uh, recess our open session and go into closed session, return as soon as we're able. Nine fifty three, so we'll be back in open session. Uh, item twelve A, take any action based on discussions held in closed session under agenda item twelve. I don't believe there's any action to take. Item thirteen A, take any action based on discussions held in closed session under agenda item thirteen. I do not believe there's any action to take. Uh, so next we'll move to requests and announcements and announcements by the acting city manager. Nothing additional. Uh, next one request by mayor and council members that items be placed on a future city council agenda. Any that um, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Gutierrez. I'd like to place on the agenda code of ethics violation against uh, Council Council Member Kaiser. So I understand you're saying to discuss there's an, I think all the council received a an email. You want to discuss that? Yes, sir. Um Okay. Um, I don't receive the email. I thought that. It was. I have it here. Somewhere. Well, if there, if yeah, if anybody didn't receive, we'll make sure that everybody got it. Let, let's let's discuss afterward to make sure that we do that correctly. Any others, Mr. Davis? Can we at some point in the near future get a, a presentation from the staff on the? Um, UDC and recommendations for UDC regarding sheds, the standard for sheds in the in the uh, in the city. Based off that email that we got today. Ah yes. Uh, how much time does staff need? We have that one. Okay. Thank you. So next meeting. Any others, Mr. Crawford? Mr. Mayor, can we put on the agenda for maybe the tenth uh, discussion with council about the Wiedersheim Road and the Wiedersheim Road project? Are we in negotiation still with Sublo on that? So we can have it on. We can get a briefing on where we are in negotiation. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. What? We'll, okay. Anything else? No. All right. Next item we have are announcements by mayor and council members. We'll start with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola. Nothing tonight, sir. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Davis? Nothing, sir. Mr. Gutierrez? Nothing. Mr. Larson? Nothing. Mr. Edwards? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor had an opportunity to go to the um, Shirts Library annual mini golf tournament. That was pretty cool. Um, the fundraiser, I don't know what the total number was, but um, it was a consistent stream of people there all day long. So great turnout. Thank you to the um, Library Foundation for what they're doing. Very good. Dr. Kaiser? I have nothing. Thank you. All right. Mr. Crawford? Nothing, sir. And uh, I have nothing to add this evening either. So if there's nothing else from council or from staff, then we stand adjourned. <laughs>